Townsend. McKiernan. Here. Ramirez. Here. Johnson. Kane. Here. Townsend. I'm here. Johnson. Here. Alvey. Here. All right. So again, 21, 2021 to 2025 capital maintenance, maintenance and improvement presentation. I turn it over now to Mr. Bach. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as we get started this year, and I'll ask Kathleen, you can go ahead and put your presentation up or whoever is in charge of loading it up on the screen. So we're ready to roll with that. Um, so we'll start into this. Um, this year has been one that's evolved quite a bit as we started. As we were er earlier in the year, I think we were looking ahead at our projections and feeling, feeling good about everything, which I guess is a good place to be in. Um, obviously, with what's happened with the, the COVID virus and the, the impact on the economy, it's changed a little bit. What we're talking about tonight, though, is really one where we look ahead for the next several years. It's the, it's the debt funded project. So these projects are not necessarily impacted by what's happening now, today. Um, but it does provide a little bit of uncertainty as we look out into the, the future years because we go, well, will we return back to normal quickly? Will we see a downturn in the economy that's happening now and then and recover well? Will we have a couple of dips in the economy or do we go down and we stay down for longer periods of time? So with, with that uncertainty, it, it does influence where we're at. I will say this year, and as I've told you in previous meetings, we're tightening the belt on things we're doing. We're we are pulling back in our expenses that are in the 2020 year. Um, we have to deep dip into uh, reserve somewhat probably to get through or to look at 21. Um, so it does put us at a point of questioning just how much we want to leverage as we look ahead to 221 and, and debt projects. But overall, you still should look at it from what strategy we're looking at going forward. And I think the team is really um, done a good job of putting together and, and Kathleen go on to the next slide I know you want to redo reintroduce your group but you can do that after I get done so I mean we have strategies for solving our community needs evolving through systems um, overcoming significant we got to overcome some even operating efficiencies but as we look at this you know the policy discussion that you all have had every year when we get into CMIP is particularly that which is directly impacted by the general fund, which is supported by tax dollars. And so we have about 17 mills that are out there dedicated toward our, our debt funds every year. That's pretty significant when you look at it on the city operating side of the budget, that those 17, that we have about 38. So we have just a little bit more 21 mills to go toward our operating. So as a ratio, that's a fairly high number. And you all have had that discussion for the past couple of years about hmm, we don't want to put in additional debt. Well, we're going to take a dive into that tonight and look at it and say, okay, we can keep to that number of spending about 15 million a year, plus or minus depending on the year, but move through that point and try not to put more in debt. Um, that does limit us on what we can do. If we stay with our current CMIP project budget and we spend a little bit more than that over the years, we're able to fund several of the projects we've talked about, but then we'd need to reduce back down to that 15 million level five years out. But that does put more money into debt over that time period. And then another option is you can look at the amount of millage that's currently dedicated toward our debt service, not increasing it at all. And that opens the door to do a lot more projects that we could do by putting in them to debt. It's a, it's a good policy discussion and our intent tonight is really to walk through um, where things are, talk about some of the, uh, the projects that are out there. We, we did produce these documents out to you on, on Monday when we sent out the notice for the agenda, but I know we don't always have a lot of time to get into some. Some of you may have the chance to look through a few of them. But that's what we set out here tonight. And as we go through it, we have a a lot of different people ready to present. So I'm going to turn this over to Kathleen Von Atchen and our chief financial officer. 
Uh, Kathleen's going to do some introductions and, and get us going into this. Kathleen? Uh, good evening. So <clears throat> tonight we're going to have a variety of people uh, make presentations um, on various slides. So I'm going to, off the top of my memory, I'm going to uh, run through them. Uh, we have our public works director, Jeff Fisher. Uh, our uh, assistant county administrator, Alan House, will be also presenting. Uh, the My budget director, Reginald Lindsay, the uh, um, my deputy CFO, um, Debbie Johncher. We're also going to have um, a new uh, kind of addition to the public works team. The fiscal officer for public works is named Sam Herr. He used to be the intern in budget. We're also going to have Rob Anderson, who's the uh, the asset manager or asset coordinator for in the public works department. And boy, <coughs> if I missed anyone, uh, I apologize. So, uh, uh, but everyone's on the call, ready to go. Oh, and then also, of course, we're also going to have our uh, human resources director, Renee Ramirez, who's going to be talking about one of the projects and its business case. So a lot of people are going to be talking. I'm going to start out. Uh, by just introducing the organization of the presentation. First, we're going to start with the city um, debt projects. That's that 17 mills that, that uh, Doug is talking about that are all funded out of the city bonded interest fund. Then we're going to talk about the county or public building commission debt projects. Um, they are funded with a two mill um, property tax revenue. And then as well as any uh, kind of transfers in from the county funds or other funds um, that are issued as PBC debt for lease revenue bonds. And then we're going to talk about other debt projects. Um, those are projects that are paid for from, from special, um, special revenues or from grants. Um, so to get started, um, we have a couple of uh, fantastic new uh, CMIP initiatives. Um, and so Reginald Lindsay is going to start out talking about the first one, which is our new CMIP budget process. Lindsay? Thank you, Kathleen. This is Reginald Lindsay. We kicked off our CMIP process in October of 2019 so that we could vet our CMIP more by using new tools like our facility condition assessment tool and then also our capital project criteria ranking system. So one of the things that we did was we started core groups. And so we had a infrastructure core group, a facilities core group, a technology and innovations core group. And what the facilities core group did was uh, they looked at anything that was project related to any work that was on our facilities. And then we also had an infrastructure core group that did all other public works projects outside of buildings. So anything to do with streets and traffic engineering. Then we also had a technology innovations core group. And that was for projects related to keep our organization more innovative technology wise. So we started this whole process back in October and we usually would start the process at the beginning of the year in January. But one of the things we wanted to be able to do was spend a little more time on projects so we started these three core groups so that they could review the projects as they came in from departments. And it would give us a little more time. One of the complaints we had from departments is that they had very little time to enter their projects. They had like a two to three week time frame to enter projects. So now we provided where they had a month to look at projects. And then even after that, they had time to research it and then it would go to the core groups and the core groups would vet the projects, make sure that they could source them out. And from there, we would take the project to the county administrator's office. Uh, but before we take it to the county administrator's office, we would meet with departments and the core groups all in one setting to discuss the projects as they happen and as they are submitted. So during that time, we would review documents. And 
And so that kind of puts us in where we have all the steps we have, where we have the CMIP kickoff, which is the number one step. Then we have the second step, which is to gather information. And then we have the third step, review and update financial forecasts. And then number four, analyze data. And then number five, where we prepare CMIP scenarios. And number six, where we participate in meetings with the Planning and UG Commission. That's where we are tonight. Now I'm gonna turn it back over to Kathleen. As Reggie does that, I'm just gonna to ask to each of the staff members, as you come up with your turn to speak, uh, turn your camera on. The commissioners have their camera on. We are live on TV, so I'd like to see y'all so you can have that engagement as you're speaking. Thank you. Kathleen, you are on mute. So thanks. Uh, I uh, so I was just saying that hopefully my camera won't keep falling off my uh, monitor here. Um, all right. So the next step here is uh, the the next new initiative that we undertook was we spent a number of hours, uh, Debbie, Elise, and I. Um, um, updating a new debt forecasting model. And um, it's similar to the model we use for the long range financial plan. It's, uh, I think you've heard of it before, MuniCast, um, and a number of cities use it. And we're hope we are using it tonight to evaluate different uh, scenarios dependent on the level of capital investment and economic factors impacting revenue sources. And we hope that it answers a, a variety of policy analysis questions. Um, we want to make decisions based on data. And of course, this model is gonna greatly improve the transparency of our, um, our debt uh, portfolio. So the next initiative, um, I'm gonna pass this on to John Kelly is the facility condition assessment, which he undertook, John. Uh, good evening, Mayor, uh, Commissioner, and Administration, and other uh, staff here tonight. Um, I just want to let everybody know that this has uh, kind of been a long time coming for our, our buildings and logistics team uh, by going through this uh, initiative. Uh, we've teamed up with a company by the name of Amoresco that we've been working with uh, essentially for about the last year and a half, where we uh, had them work with multiple uh, end users from police, fire, parks, uh, water pollution along with, uh, you know, buildings and logistics. <clears throat> so essentially what they went out and did was they went out and looked at all of our assets from parking lot structures to all of our uh, buildings and such, which was roughly around 215 uh, sites. So with this particular uh, 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 survey assessment that they did was they went in and looked at everything from the building envelope to the, the roof structures, to windows, to carpeting and so on and so forth, to where they basically did an assessment of finding that we're roughly about $75 million in deferred backlog. And even though that number to some may seem like, wow, that's a, that's a big number. Uh, and uh, yes, it is a rather large number. And we know that we just can't take a, a stab at that number right off uh, the start. But I do want to let everybody know over the last two budget cycles, we have projects that are in place that are getting ready to uh, basically get started that really takes that number down from 75 million, roughly to around 58 to 60 million just within the next year. Uh, and one of the reasons too is they assess the Reardon Center and as we know that you guys approved here a few weeks back uh, for a development project that that, that uh, particular building uh, comes offline. So that starts taking that deferred backlog number uh, down considerably as we start looking at some of our buildings and what the needs are. Um, also with the fire department and some of their uh, fire stations as they continue to uh, uh, produce new fire stations and merge fire stations into new, we start taking that deferred cost down uh, slowly. So this is just really something that we're uh, really excited about. It allows us to come to you guys, to the finance department and to the elected body to be able to come in and look and really have a, a, a methodical approach on how we spend dollars over the next 
you know, five to 10 years on making sure that we keep our assets uh, where they need to be. So this is just a little snapshot that, like I said, we continue to work with Amoresco and our team. Uh, there's other things as we go through in the presentation that, that we'll talk about that will uh, overall look at how we might have other ways of uh, saving or reducing some of these costs. Thank you. So um, along with this, uh, the assessment that took place, there's also an, a, a software package that um, that houses a tremendous amount of information about every facility, including photos. And, and so it's really an invaluable tool and we are very excited about it. Mayor, do you have a question on that? Yes, thank you. Uh, so I'm confused. Um, it says 250 million liability over future 30 years, 75 million in identified deferred backlog, which I understand has been reduced to 58 to 60. I'm, I'm confused about the liability over future 30 years. What does we see 75 million in identified deferred backlog that really needs to be addressed really in the near future? And so what does that mean then for the 250 million liability over future 30 years? I'm just not clear what, what that refers to here. Thank you. Well, that is the, the part there that's a 75 that John referenced that was down a little bit really is things they look at and said, we need to be taking action on these projects now. Um, versus when you're saying the 250, that's like you look at a building life and then you say, okay, in 10 years, you're going to need to make this improvement to it. In 15 years, you're going to need to make these improvements to it. John, you want to elaborate a little more on that? Well, yes. And, and Mayor, a lot of that with that number, when you see the 250, that's essentially if we continue down the path that we're going over the next 30 years with not putting uh, proper amounts to, uh, you know, deal with our assets, that that's the number that it looks like. So really for the dollars that we've been putting into our facilities, we need to come up basically with an average of spending close to about eight to 10 million uh, a year essentially to uh, get to a, 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 a spot where we can say that that deferred backlog goes away and then we continue down a path for our facilities that we stay at a moderate level that our uh, uh, FCI is in such a critical state which is basically a facility assessment index so it's 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 really important that we just and like I said when we look at that 75 million dollar number and as we go over the next five years doing projects we're starting to come down. So as that number comes down, that 250 over the next 30 years comes down, as we uh, present and have this tool, as Kathleen talked about, this tool and the data they give us helps us make uh, uh, intelligent and uh, methodical approach on spending dollars to make sure we, we're just not keep going up and that we can uh, come down and kind of have a, a status approach throughout the uh, years. Yeah, exactly, John. It's basically the, uh, it's basically how much we would have to pay if we did nothing for the next 30 years. Yeah. To catch up in 30 years time, if we don't do anything to, to maintain the improvements, then we're going to be behind by 250 million. But right now we're looking at being 58 million behind. Just Correct. For the short term. For the short term. Okay, thank you. That's clear. So um, tonight um, uh, we're going to talk in this section of the presentation. We're going to talk about the the city and the the county debt, and then later on other special revenue funds. But um, we're gonna we're looking at um, debt from three different scenarios, and so that's what we're uh, presenting here in this slide. So the current uh, CMIP, as adopted. Um, uh, for Kansas City, Kansas, if you add up the five uh, years, so the next four years plus the additional year, uh, because we're in a new budget year, so 2021 through 2025, um, those projects amount to roughly $87 million. And on the, on the county side, the Wyandotte County side, we, we do not have any debt um, programs in the adopted budget for the county side. Now, if we were to, scenario one, bring down the adopted budget for the Kansas City, Kansas debt target, um, which is seven, it's $80 million, um, that would bring down um, the annual debt 
from, fit to, from where it is in the adopted level to 15 million a year plus a little CPI every year. So CPI um, being 2% a year. So if you add up those um, 15 million times five with a little CPI, it adds up to $80 million. And you can see that's, that's uh, roughly $7 million less than what we currently have programmed. On the Wyandotte County side, um, we have scenario one where in, we're introducing or proposing an $8 million investment, which we'll talk about. So we're calling that sort of the current level, right? If we want to, so this is maintaining the current level, the, these two, the adopted or the scenario one. If we move on to investing in our neighborhoods, which I'm calling a neighborhood capital investment plan, we um, then want to take a look at what is in scenario two and scenario three. And scenario two basically includes those projects that the departments have submitted. And, and we've gone through and reviewed all of these projects. And, um, and we're, you're gonna see the detail there in a minute. The, the third scenario uh, builds upon scenario two, but it adds in a street lights replacement plan, which, is, which costs $50 million um, over the five year period. And it also adds a few more uh, projects on the county side for uh, repairs to the West Annex building, okay? So you're gonna get more detail on this, but what, how we're looking at the CMIP, a little different than in the past, is um, we're kind of looking at, at it in terms of the total dollars over the five-year period, rather than you know, getting kind of mired in the staging of what year it starts and increment e each year. We're just looking at the total dollars over the five-year period to make it simpler, okay? Um, so tonight's presentation, um, we're gonna start out with the city debt projects. And so here's the city debt projects uh, break, broken out by these different scenarios, very similar to what I just mentioned before. Um, we've got um, the adopted budget, which is that uh, $87 million, which is $7 million over this $15 million tar uh, per year target. Um, and it includes the current adopted CMIP, which was through 2020 through 2024. But in this case, we're only looking at starting at 2021 because 2020 already is a year that we're already in and we're, we already uh, embarked on those projects. And then we added a continuation of annual improvement projects in the last year, okay? Um, the scenario one would meet the debt target um, of $80 million. So it reduced the CMIP by seven. It also adds in um, the issuance of a two-year um, temporary note to be paid off in 2021 and 22 um, in the amount of $6.7 million. And that's for an, uh, eight, uh, human resources and finance um, ERP solutions project. Um, what we found through a review of all of our debt funds, we found that um, over time, the city and the county bond and interest funds have been accumulating excess reserves um, th that uh, are a result of having refinanced the, our prior year bonds at lower interest rates. And also when projects get completed and the project or the bond proceeds may not have been 100% all spent, those funds have to, uh, by state law, have to be reverted back to, this, to the bond and interest funds. And so um, those, those funds, the, the, between those two things, we've accumulated some excess reserves. And state law does not allow you to spend any of that, uh, any of that money that's dedicated for debt service for other, anything other than debt service. So what we're proposing is a two-year note to um, pay for a, the replacement of our current um, aging ERP system um, using this temporary financing in the fall of this year and then refinancing and then paying it off the subsequent year. So, so but we'll get more into that in, later on. The second scenario um, is $109 million over the five year period. And it's a neighborhood capital investment plan. It augments street preservation. It adds in a fire station in 2025 and it has many other needs. Um, and then the third scenario, as I mentioned, is the same as scenario two, but adding in uh, a Kansas City-wide street 
light replacement project that would it sequenced so that it would be $10 million per year. Now, each of these scenarios, we have uh, done financial forecasting and, and, and uh, not only in a modest uh, revenue position, but also in a, in a worst case scenario. And we have, um, we have those charts and we can show you exactly what that looks like uh, once we get to that point. But uh, all right, so the next step, I'm gonna pass this on to, um, I think it's Reginald, right? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you, Kathleen. <laughs> so current view we have on screen right now is basically touching on what Kathleen just talked about is kind of showing where the projects spread out over the scenario one, scenario two, and scenario three. And if you're looking at the screen, scenario one, again, is our $80 million target, uh, which what we traditionally follow. And then scenario two is our $109 million target. And then scenario three is our $159 million It kind of shows where uh, the changes are within the different scenarios. We can see if we stick to our $80 million, some of the projects we had to cut back, like for instance, the neighborhood, 88 per district. And then the Reggie, we're having a little trouble with your surfacing. audio. I'm not sure how you're set up there, but you kind of seem to be going in and out on us. Okay, can you hear me fine, fine now? Mm, you still cut out. If you have your phone nearby, you should probably turn it off. I don't have my phone nearby. I'm using my computer. I hadn't had any issues before. Well, you're you're clear there. So sure. hope we'll go ahead and try it. Hopefully you stay clear. All righty. So as I was saying, in the 47th and Oracle, we're, we're servicing. Reggie, we're not getting you. You're cutting in and out. I think your uh, internet connection is fading on us. Yeah, Doug, I was going to ask Reggie, they're on five where the uh, Wi-Fi signal, uh, Reggie, are you, are you just Wi-Fi or do you have a hard ethernet cable to your computer? I, I am Wi-Fi. Uh, you might need to move. Uh, I know you're in your conference room, I can see, and I don't want to disrupt that, but if you go into the fifth floor conference room uh, or somewhere closer where you know the Wi-Fi, but I know the fifth floor conference room there has our Wi-Fi uh, system, so that might help things. All right, we can all watch Reggie move as he relocates into a, hopefully a better situation. All set, Reg. Maybe not. Um, we might have to shift over to somebody else to take us through this. Kathleen, do you or Debbie want to do this part, or do you have somebody? Might else? also, Young might also turn off his his video. That would reduce the bandwidth requirements. And just use his audio. If you might try turning your camera off. Reggie, you want to turn your camera off? Yeah, he's already he's off. Out. So um, moving on. So um, what we've presented here is, um, you know, all of the projects. You see the first column is the adopted CMIP. Um, and then the second is uh, the changes from the adopted CMIP. The third is um, changes from scenario one. And then the third is the addition of the streetlight. So, um, so, and then over here is the grand total. Boy, if you sometimes, if some of you are real um, detail oriented, you might notice there's a little bit of rounding issue here. For example, on annual pavement program, sorry about that. You know, it, it it's either rounding uh, down to the bottom or rounding across. So there's a there's a little bit of a pay, uh, rounding issue here, but. Uh, 
what what what's being contemplated here is that you know as you know for example we'll talk later on is that uh, for example the annual pavement preservation program generally uh, public works will show through their pavement condition index uh, slide that the actual needs for street improvements which is um, you know the, one of the number one community survey items um, tells us that we probably should be spending 20 to 25 million dollars a year on streets and yet and yet here we're we're you know talking about spending 34 million over a five year period so or well or at least you have to add up all of these so you know the level of funding here is um, not exactly what's going to keep us um, on top of our uh, infrastructure needs but so just keep that in mind but if we are to uh, reduce our projects um, down to the $15 million level, then, you, then you're going to want to opt for a scenario one. Um, and of course, this is, these are totals over the five-year period. I'm sure there's a, you know, some finagling between the years that we can talk about. Um, and, and as we approach, um, you know, coming, as we um, move on to, um, you know, more finalized uh, recommendation discussions, which uh, we plan to have at the uh, April 30th meeting. Today's more just uh, talking about proposals. Um, on the second slide, you'll see that we've, um, in order to get to the, uh, what we've, well, actually this, the city hall st uh, structure study has been reduced by $5 million. And um, John Kelly can talk about that specifically, but I think what the What's happening there is that uh, they determined that actually the need for doing this structure, the study, and the expected cost is going to be actually five million less than what was proposed last year. Um, this one down here, the Wyandotte County Lake Water Line Study and Repair, that isn't because we're cutting the project; it's because we're moving it out of the city-funded uh, projects and over to the county-funded projects because it is a county lake. So. Um, um, uh, uh, and one interesting, so the only change really in scenario two is that we're augmenting our funding for annual concrete repair programs by 3.8 million in scenario two. We're um, supplanting our uh, investment in annual pavement preservation programs, which hits cities across the um, city. We're in increasing slightly the annual alley improvement program as requested by the department. And then we're also um, going, we're also requesting an additional fire station and slash actually traffic division uh, facility. Uh, so it's not just a fire station. I meant to add that in there. It's also a traffic division facility for the cost of $10 million in the last year of our CMIP. Okay. The third scenario, the only change is the addition of a $50 million um, street light replacement program that would hit the, all the neighborhoods across the city and uh, um, estimated to be 10 million a year, okay? Um, so this, this graph actually shows, or table actually shows um, what the same scenarios are only um, subtotaled by the various functions, you know, for streets, for bridges, traffic engineering. Um, so as you can tell, the, the adopted budget has uh, in place $45 million investment if we were to opt with scenario one, that would be reduced by $2.4 million. If we go with scenario two, that would augment that funding by $18.7 million. Um, and then if we added in the, the streetlights, then you're adding another $50 million. So that's how it all kind of goes. Okay. Hope this is a good guide for you. Um, Kathleen, and, Kathleen mm -hmm. I just want to make a comment on that. So yeah. as you're looking at scenario ones to scenario two. So scenario one has some negatives in it. Scenario two adds back in those negatives and then right. adds the other projects to it. Mm -hmm. just, just making that as a clarifying point. Yes. All right, so um, this slide now, it, we're gonna take you to the uh, prioritization um, criteria rankings, and Rob Anderson is going to talk with you about his work in that area. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, Robbie Anderson, Public Works Asset Manager. 
The importance of prioritizing a limited capital budget is not a new challenge to our organization, but at a time facing an uncertain economic future, it's even important to have a system that aids targeting our investment in a deliberate fashion. This list here shows a, the composite score of projects based on the criteria you helped outline. These projects have been organized by rank. The gray lines here represent the 2020 projects. The light blue lines represent the 2021 projects. Those marked with the year 9999 identify unfunded projects that are not in your current budget. There's a handful of other projects in there that are outlined in other out years into the future. On this slide, the point of it is to provide a point of comparison to inform discussion on which projects should take priority. This is the slide, I guess, that we did a lot of work to compare, had the earlier discussions earlier in the year, so you all would have a good feel for where we're at. Um, I think Rob's model that he's put together here and then with all the input of everybody weighing into it has really come out well, but it's one of those that as we go through and we score everything, it's also one of those when you sit down from a commissioner from your, your perspective and look at it and say, well, I know this project doesn't rank well, but it needs to move up um, for various reasons. Um, or sometimes they're by different funds and because of that fund, they're not competing against another project and they move up. Um, another point, I would, another thing I would like to call out here would be that I included the road preservation projects for 2020 to show uh, how well that ranks in this queue. Anybody have any questions on this criteria? It's a little bit, I mean, it's one of those things we went through. I know we spent the time going back through it with the committee and, and then had additional feedback on it, but you see there are some projects in here that you all have asked about for some time or wanted to see. Um, now they're all up there on the board, or at least there's 50. I, I thought I should also point out that, um, you know, when we talk above about the annual pavement condition index here, or the annual pavement preservation program, that is um, a lump sum of annual money of which um, some of the funds are reflected in these individual projects. Is that correct, Rob, Robbie? It might be the case, but not typically. It's a separate set of uh, selected streets for pavement preservation. Oh, okay. So this is Commissioner Burroughs. I do have a question on these project criteria rankings. I see nothing about the holiday. I see a bridge replacement on Holiday Drive. We have an area of Holiday Drive that is in need of major repair and I do not see it even in the five-year plan. Uh, well, there, here's a holiday uh, drive bridge replacement right here, but I sort of remember that there's a holiday drive project that was funded in 2020, maybe. Public Works needs to... Jeff or Troy? Yeah, I, I, know, what you're, uh, Jeff, I know what you're talking about. Jeff, move closer to the microphone. We will uh, I'll turn mine up. We will uh, take a look at that, Commissioner Burroughs, and make sure that's in there. It might be that that's on. Uh, these are projects over two hundred grand generally. Uh, so I'll take, I'll take a look at that with Troy and see if uh, if it's not in there, we'll, we'll include it. Commissioner, this is this is Troy, um, County Engineer. Yep. Um, the uh, I, I assume you're talking about the part between four thirty five and Lake Quivira. That's that correct. Yes, that we're going to do that this year with the pavement preservation program. So it's not it's it's not an individual project. It's part of the uh, pavement preservation program. So when we bid that out, it'll be done with that. Do we know what? Do you have a, a project cost for that? Uh, we're working on that right now. We have trying to figure out a few options to get it done without going down on the railroad property to do major work. 
we're working. We've, we've talked to Lake Quivira some too, because they've looked at it as well. So we're looking at it. Yeah, it, it's becoming a, a real traffic hazard. And I'm afraid we're going to have a major incident there before it gets addressed. So I just wanted to ensure that I brought it uh, up for discussion this evening. It's one of those areas that I believe if we don't address it, we're going to have a collapse. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mayor Albie. Um, yes, uh, Robbie, could you explain again the, the, what the different colors mean? One, uh, you said the, on the they're just, they're just an, they're an extra way to call out the different years that these are identified in the budget. Okay, so, so if, give, me, give me the color code again. The gray lines are 2020 projects. The blue lines are 2021 projects. There's a handful of other out years on there. And there's also this year marked 9999, which is intentionally used by the right. research team to identify unfunded projects. Right, thank you. And I would, I'd just like to add that the, the, prod, the road preservation projects are in there as a bundle and it doesn't represent or call out the individual line segments that are gonna be in the queue for that program. That's a lot, that's rank number three. Mm -hmm. You'll notice that the street monitorization project for 50 million is ranked 22nd out of the total 50. Commissioner Ramirez. I think you just answered my question, Kathleen. Is that the 50 million street light modernization? Is that the same thing as scenario three? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Walters. Yes. Um, I'm seeing on project number 31 some information that I don't understand. Uh, that if you're talking about the K32 quiet zone uh, phase one, that is a 2016 CMIP project. And um, I'm seeing this listed as a 2024 project, but the commission has already approved it several years ago. So what am I looking at there? You're looking at a second phase that we discussed when we brought out that first phase, Commissioner? So well, this would be phase two? Yeah, if we elect yeah. to go through with it, this would be an additional phase. Great, that's what I thought it might be, thank you. Yeah, that's the just- The other part is all bonded. That's just an error, yeah, an entry in the description of the project. Can I ask another question then? On item 43, just <coughs> to understand, 110th and Riverview is not in Kansas City, Kansas. So what is that project? Troy, can you answer to that? Yes, yeah, this is Troy Shaw County Engineer. Um, so um, Edwardsville is receiving a grant um, to make improvements to 110th and Riverview basically is. Um, um, so we put money in the budget because it might be a good opportunity for us or we, we put up a pro proposed project because it might be a good opportunity to us to make improvements to um, that interchange with um, where you exit I-70 onto uh, 110th Street at that point um, and look at our side. So it is not in Edwardsville. It is on the uh, north side of that I-70. So it, it's just a good, it's just an opportunity to work in conjunction with them and, and uh, cost savings and, and make an overall good project. Okay, well, it is somewhat confusing to give it a location that's outside our city limits. So there might be a better way to designate that. It's, we can change the name. Thank it's, you. Thank Troy, you. if it's on the uh, north side there, it's really 110th and Village West Parkway. <laughs> I think as you go north at our 118th. Yeah, north yeah it, I think it was originally done that way just so because it was, it was thought of when they applied for that grant and it just so it stayed linked. So it was known that it was linked to that. But at this point, we could change the name. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Mayor Alvey, did you have another question or the hands up? I just, I don't have control to take the hands down if you don't. Yeah, I don't see the thing. No, no, my hand's down now. Okay, thank you. Oh, I don't have the hands. I have a question. I'm sorry, I don't see that. 
Oh, the hand controller. If you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a thing where it has the other attendees or meeting attendees. If you click on that, it'll show up all the names Got it. and over on the side. And then down the bottom of that is a raise hand feature. Great. Thank you. Uh, sure. I do have one more question, if I may. The uh, number 49, the call point biosolids digestion. Uh, we have, aren't, isn't that to be coming up for discussion soon? I know we, there's been a much discussion about that. Are, are we locked into that yet as a body? Uh, we just had a round on threes and we will need another round of on threes coming up in the next few weeks, Commissioner. Uh, the scope of that has you know, changed a little bit. Uh, so we'll get that back to you. Rob, Robbie can explain why it rated so low. Um, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, sure. So the ranking process here has another step to improve, and that's going to be taking these types of projects that are huge benefits to an entire system or sewer shed and calculating uh, the benefits in that manner. So it's just a step to improve this. Also, these are both extremely expensive projects but they have long-term benefits to the network system as a whole. And we expect that the return on investment uh, for this project specifically is very positive, very favorable. So it, it's almost, re it's revenue neutral. So more better. Another, another thing to think about here is some of these might have other reasons why we have to do these, obviously. Okay, so this is the, the large project criteria rankings as they come through, as we have it built into our five-year plan. You see the dates on the, um, next to the number that shows where those projects fall. So as we move on into our, our, our ranking, we have to look at it. If there's some project you're looking that needs to be moved up or you're feeling very strong about wanting it to be moved up, then that's where you should um, we'll want to come back at that as we get closer into the budget process and, um, and weigh in and make sure you note or see. So if it's going to move up in front of something that's already funded or to move into the five-year plan, but the others are still, if they're in 9999, they are waiting for their place in the queue to to make it into our five-year plan, okay? All right. Okay, uh, I'm sure most would agree that a strong transportation system uh, is necessary to communities uh, welfare and vitality. It's important to the safe uh, and efficient movement of people and goods, of course. And case to case citizens, I uh, believe street maintenance, street preservation is the most important and requires the most emphasis based on the last three citizen surveys. Next slide, please. We know uh, that our average PCI is a 56 uh, out of 100, and the commission's goal is 65. That requires a lot of investment to move the needle that much. The UG was to make a sudden shift from current level of roughly 6 million a year to uh, 20 million a year, uh, which we know is uh, most unlikely, the curves would be accelerated uh, to a few years. The uptick in the PCI would only take a few years. We know that's uh, uh, not likely. So the great thing is that we can predict outcomes now with the data base we have uh, based on level of investment and street preservation activities. Most certainly the UG will need to increase the levels of investment each year and sustain it for a period of time uh, to get the system back on track and to support that vitality that I think we all want. Thank you. Um, this next slide is for um, Alan House. Are you on? I'm here. Great. All right. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Alan House, uh, Assistant County Administrator, Chief Knowledge Officer, and as Kathleen mentioned earlier in the presentation, one of the projects in the CMIP this year uh, is in what we call an ERP or Enterprise Resource Planning uh, software project that is for both the, the human capital, human resource needs, 
and the finance needs of the organization. And uh, so the, the question of, you know, how do we, why do we need this uh, system and you know, what is it serving that the, you know, we really identified that the lack of a, a modern enterprise resource planning system is a operational sort of constraint for the, the UG and you know, it is, it, you know, inhibits the ability of the organization to more effectively meet the, the, uh, the goals that this commission has set, sort of those strategic goals, uh, because a lot of our current processes are, are paper bound. Um, and you know, you'll hear more about that from uh, Rene Ramirez, Director of Human Resources, uh, but it also is an inhibitor in our ability to attract and retain and train talent. So um, starting about 18 to 24 months ago, you know, there was a kind of a confluence between human resources and finance in the recognition of the, the need for uh, new and better tools for the organization, as well as kind of a, a an organic, you might say, uh, outcry or, or a desire that emerged from departments uh, who were also sort of struggling with the, the use of the existing tools. Uh, so we put together a, a broad-based cross-departmental team that looked at, um, you know, what are the options out there in the marketplace? And this is a team that was HR, uh, finance, accounting, payroll, technology, public works, procurement. Uh, so a broad set of stakeholders within the UG with a diverse set of needs for, again, for, for the way that we manage the operations within the organization. Um, and so they went through an extensive process and some of that's laid out here on the slide to look at, again, what's in the marketplace. Uh, they did a number of uh, uh, vendor demos to, to see what, not just what looks good on paper, but uh, to actually kick the tires on a number of, of different software systems, uh, held you know, an extensive number of, of meetings um, to more deeply sort of plumb what are, the, what are the operational requirements and how do these kind of back office functions support the, really the, the more effective delivery of services, uh, including what you just heard for example, from Public Works and the ability to deliver projects kind of on time, on budget, and, and you know, meet those resident needs. Um, ultimately, as a result of that kind of extensive due diligence process that the, the team landed on their preference for a system, and it's a software, it's a company called Workday. Um, it is recognized as the, the leader in the marketplace for ERP systems. Um, it is one that is cloud-based and that we think is flexible, secure, and meets the needs not only for today, but we really see it as being a solution that will meet the needs for the next 10 uh, or more years for the organization. So when we looked at, okay, who else is using this particular software and how are they using it? We looked both at local organizations and you can see to the right there, um, some of the local organizations that are kind of premier within our, uh, within our community within the region that are using Workday. The KU Med Center and Health Services are both in the, uh, using it in the midst of an implementation. H&R Block, uh, Cerner, the Federal Reserve. Uh, these are all clients who have you know, incredible, incredibly high uh, requirements for security and for operational excellence. Uh, we also looked at other local government customers. We looked at the combined city and county of Denver. Uh, again, a consolidated government. We looked at uh, current uh, Kayenta customers, which is the software used for finance today. And you can see there the kind of a, a broader list of, uh, of government customers that have made this transition um, to this product. And so you know, that's kind of the, gives you a broad sense of the, the scope and the depth of the work that the, um, the team has been doing across the UG to uh, look at and discern and decide on what we think is a, a recommended um, approach for how to move our organization uh, again forward today as well as uh, set us up well for the future. So if you look at um, the next slide here, and I won't spend a lot of time in this because I spoke a lot of this. You know, our, our current uh, current software, we already have multiple softwares. We have databases um, and access for HR. Uh, we've got you know, different uh, spreadsheets and that sort of thing that procurement uses. We've got a Kayenta, which is our core financial system, uh, which is an older system, older platform, and uh, really we kind of outgrown it, and it no longer meets the needs of our organization. And 
consumes a lot of staff time in the, in the use uh, of that, as well as making it more challenging to get information and data out uh, of that system that can be used uh, by, uh, for management and, and ultimately for the commission in making decisions about funding. So we see uh, Workday as being something that is, uh, it's a modern, highly configurable system. Again, it's cloud-based. Uh, it's mobile friendly. It's got a lot of self-service functions for, for employees to, to do things like sign up for benefits online, to make all those enrollment decisions. So, um, and we see it as highly secure uh, at a level of security that we currently, uh, you know, we have good security, but, but uh, this would enhance that even further, uh, as well as giving us a lot more insight in, through data and reporting uh, into how we're spending money how we're tracking projects uh, and how we are, again, effectively delivering uh, <clears throat> solutions to the residents with the resources that the commission has made available to us. So with that, I will turn it uh, over to Renee Ramirez, our Director of Human Resources, to discuss further. Thank you, Alan. Um, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, the Workday Human uh, Capital Management System, which you see on your screen there, offers many different modules for our team to utilize to be more strategic and analyze data to assist us with making better decisions regarding our workforce. Today, our workforce at the Unified Government is made up of five different generations. We have the traditional generation, we have the boomers, and then we have generation X, Y, and Z who are working for us. As the silver tsunami hits us, we have employees who are entering or are near retirement, and the issue of recruitment and retention of top talent is vital to any organization. Across our region, at all levels, at the local, state, and federal level, in the next 10 to 15 years, it is projected that we will need approximately 30,000 public service employees. The public sector has always been viewed as lacking in technology and falling behind the times. In order for us to remain competitive in this market, we need to be prepared to advance our organization in a direction that can attract tomorrow's workforce. In an article um, that I read from The Hill, it mentions that by the year 2020, which we're in now, 75% of the workforce will be millennials. Some of the challenges that we face with our current system today is that, again, like Alan mentioned, our processes are largely um, based, paper-based with approximately 40 steps to complete the hiring process. And that's from uh, when we recruit an applicant to the onboarding process, which is day one of orientation. It takes approximately 104 days to fill positions, which then causes departments to um, have to call in for overtime, which impacts all of our budgets. We use manual processes as Alan alluded to, we use Microsoft um, Access and Excel spreadsheets, not only in human resources, but throughout the organization. And these applications that we're using are merely uh, supposed to be used as short-term fixes, but we've been using them on long-term basis, which present risk of security breaches. We currently have a legacy system that we've used for at least 30 years that we've actually outgrown. And with a new robust system, uh, we can leverage process improvements by many things. One of the things that we'd like to do is really improve on our business processes to positively affect our applicant pools by making it easier to apply. Um, I'm not sure that we'll be able to eliminate paper applications all the way, but going in a direction where we're able to allow our applicants to apply online is going to be definitely going in a positive direction. Providing a user-friendly experience when our applicants can apply and do an online application in anywhere from five to seven minutes or less, um, that's what our, our workforce is looking for now. Uh, we're going to be able to take our 40 steps down to approximately 13 steps, which is going to save not only the human resources staff, but it will save every hiring manager and anyone in the hiring process time uh, when filling positions. It's gonna allow us to automate many of our uh, processes for the onboarding, performance management, benefits, employee development, and many other HR concentrations that um, you see on the left-hand side. And there's a lot more benefits that you'll see on the right-hand side of that slide. But most importantly, it allows for the 
better visibility into our processes. The impact of, of having a new system will provide us with a new way of doing business, transforming our processes to be automated, allowing us to continue to grow as a competitor in the public sector market. We will be able to improve the overall experience for both internal and our external customers and position our organization to becoming a high performing organization and aligning ourselves to become a premier employer in Wyandotte County. And now I'll turn it back over to Kathleen. Well, yeah, Renee, you said it. And I, I do want to mention uh, on this slide, you notice how there is no software package on the left-hand side. That's because it's all being done either manually or with, or with Excel. So our current state is um, very manual. Uh, the next step over here is- Kathleen, uh, we have a couple of questions. So why don't we take great. those before we jump on to the next. So okay, uh, Commissioner Burroughs. I think you're still muted, Commissioner. Thank you. I, I, I I'm sorry. I, is that better? Yes. Thank uh, you. I really like this. Uh, I really do like this workday solution here. This is anything that would get rid of a legacy system that allows us to be more efficient and effective in what we do. It addresses not only the amount of manpower, the 104 days to fill positions is really quite burdensome, not only on the system itself, but on those that uh, on, on time management. It, I really do like the benefits of this work day. I look, look through it. I uh, researched a little that is of importance if you want to be an efficient modern day government. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, Mayor? Thank you. Uh, so let's just, um, I think that there's someone who does not uh, run a, a business office. Um, I think some of what we've been describing is maybe out of reach for a lot of people who don't do this on a daily basis. But if you could just kind of put in the context, if we had had this uh, solution in place, how would it have affected our, our what we've, how we've had to respond to COVID-19? just in terms of how we're able to continue doing processes without a lot of uh, changeover? Well, currently what we had to do to address, uh, we had to really, we've had an online application for many years, but the burden that that has created for applicants is that they're not able to, um, you know, basically um, input that application into a database. So what happens for an applicant right now, they have to, fill out the online application, they have to save it to their computer, and then they have to email it to us. And uh, one of the things that um, we've been able to do is, while we're still using that process, today, in order to do interviews and to keep some of the hiring processes going, uh, we have been um, using uh, the Microsoft Teams for <coughs> video interviewing, which is something that we've never done before. This, um, um, Workday product is going to allow us to continue with those types of things in a more robust robust way. The other thing that I think is really important here is that right now we have to call applicants, um, set them up for um, interviewing, and do all those manual steps. With a product like this, the hiring manager is going to be able to review applications. Right now, my staff we're still accepting paper applications, getting them through email. We then have to print those off. Uh, then we have to create a folder, send them through email to um, the hiring departments and hope that they get everything through. We're using Xfer. So we could have a position that we could get anywhere from, if it's posted on Indeed, we've had anywhere from, anywhere from 100 to 300 applications come in through that process. So my staff has to go into the office, they got to scan everything in and then try to get it through email to the hiring department. And then the hiring department has to share that with the people that are going to be on their panel. So it becomes burdensome um, all along the process there. But a product like this. If, uh, jump into Renee to, to uh, supplement, I think your answer 
you may or your question around, you know, what is in the current situation in terms of reacting to COVID, what does something like this allow us to do or what are some of the, the challenges is, uh, you know, most of the over 70% of the costs of our organization are uh, through personnel, you know, that is that local government delivers services through people. Uh, and as the has been presented to this commission uh, within the last couple of weeks, as we look at options for how to address what we anticipate to be a, a shortfall of sort of undetermined magnitude, the ability to sort of do scenario planning and to um, to look at and say, okay, how many uh, how many positions do we need to hold back on hiring, and how quickly do those savings accrue to our bottom line, uh, is a very uh, human intensive process now between HR and finance. Uh, and so having a software like this would allow us to much more rapidly be able to look at you know, where is the cash, uh, where are cash projects, where are cash equipment costs, where are um, unfilled uh, positions in various sort of states within the, the process of being filled and allow us to move more nimbly uh, to address uh, and to make changes for how we deal with you know, this unexpected uh, change, as well as then to implement, uh, say, a, a you know, hiring slowdown or other uh, solutions kind of on the, on, the, on the back end of that once decisions are made. Uh, using a system like this, it becomes much more uh, possible and, and quicker to kind of implement those, those changes. And, and Kathleen may also have something to add. Uh, yeah, uh, well, yeah, absolutely. So for example, um, uh, Ron Green is our payroll manager and uh, every pay period he updates a spreadsheet that um, tracks our revenue trend, our, our payroll trends in order to see how, um, how closely we are keeping track with what we expect our vacancy rate to be. And it's a great big spreadsheet that he updates every, every pay period. And, um, but absolutely, it's difficult to really, really be able to see exactly how many positions are open, waiting to be filled, um, when, and, and estimate um, when that's gonna, when is that gonna happen and when will they be filled? And with this Workday product, it would be so seamless and, and fantastic. So, um, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, bore you with the finance side. But I do want to tell you that, um, you know, the Cayenta system has really served the organization well. And I, you know, but um, it's a legacy system. We want to get out of the 1990s and into the 2020s. And this is going to take us there. It's, it's, a, a, it's, a, a, it's the new software that all of the major and important organizations are turning to. It has um, 10 years of of uh, experience uh, uh, successfully bringing and transforming organizations. It's a solid investment in the organization's future. And um, on the next slide, I'm gonna, we're gonna have such better decision-making, better information all across the board. And I'm gonna show you the return on investment here on the next slide. Um, so um, I have identified a relatively painless way of uh, pay paying for this investment. I realize it's difficult to take the dollars to, to, to fund a, a software package like this, but we have found a way to very effectively at a minimal cost and with minimum pain um, be able to fund this um, project. Uh, overall, we, we estimate the service implementation services cost to be 3.6 million. Uh, the annual SaaS or you know subscription service during the implementation will be 2.7 million. We're estimating it's going to take us about between 18 and 24 months to um, complete the implementation. There's a, a one-time delivery uh, and training and adoption kit of 525,000, and we've got just a little bit of funds here in order to assist the the staff with some redundancy during the implementation process for a total $7 million. We have an uh, open encumbrance for some other software packages that we've been holding of about 280,000. So that brings the capital project total to 6.7. And um, as I mentioned before, through our reconciliation of all the many debt funds we have, because it's, we don't just have the bonded interest fund and the city 
the city and the county bond and interest. We also have funds for every TIF. And so we went through and we reconciled all of them over the 20, um, 22 period, year period that the organization's uh, been consolidated. And um, we know exactly how much is available in reserves in the respective city and county bond and interest fund. And um, there's, more, there's more funds in here, but this is how much um, we have estimated um, can come to fund uh, various functions that are op or departments that are um, that where FTE are well the general fund FTE allocation for the city general fund and then for the county general fund and then the allocation for FTE in all the other funds and that's how these dollar amounts were determined. Uh, we we are wanting to use reserves during 2021 and 2022 to fund um, the 3.3 million out of the city and then 1.9 million, million out of the county bond and interest fund. And then the 1.5 million from other funds is mainly from the sewer fund. Um, and though these payments would take place over the next two years beginning in 2021, we hope to do a, a temporary note this fall with your approval. And the table on the on the right here um, demonstrate we, we uh, we actually sought expert help to, de to develop a business case analysis where we um, identified all of the various benefits that it's going to, that the organization is going to um, achieve by, um, by the end of this implementation. And what we found is that all of those will have a, a very positive impact on the bottom line of our organization, resulting in roughly between four and $6 million per year in savings across the entire $400 million budget. And as a result of that savings, we expect to recover the $7 million um, over the next three and a half years. So this is a really great investment in our organization. And it falls right in line with our priority-based budgeting because um, the priority-based budgeting uh, our objective was to identify two and a half, at least two and a half million dollars in savings um, from administrative and efficiencies. And this is what, how we're hoping to achieve that savings. Unfortunately, we have to do a little bit of an investment in our own organization in order to, to achieve that savings. But over the long haul, we're going to be saving a lot of money in administrative costs once we get this um, solution in place. So. And I'm happy to talk through all of the factors that go into how we, um, how the business analysis told us that we're going to be saving between four and six million a year. So, I want to say that this is a project that, when staff brought me these original projections and where it was going, I was skeptical. Um, having been in this organization a long time, I'm very familiar with the user, how the um, <clears throat> current system works for us. I'm also very familiar with the complications and the difficulties of trying to tie different areas together. So um, at one point they called me into a room and had about 30 different members across various four parts of our organization that were users of the system that explained all the different efficiencies they could go through to make things better in their operations. Um, it's hard to say it sometimes to come back to it, but as an organization or our size, when we are over a couple thousand employees, um, there are mistakes made, mistakes made in payroll um, that comes up from where things are inventoried, where they come out. So there are missed payments that come in that overpay our employees from time to time. We always, they're always found if we underpay because that gets brought up by the individual, but they're not always the other way. Um, and, and some of the audit checks we've gone back through to find things like that. Uh, <clears throat> it's a little staggering when you look at some of the money that can accumulate, especially on an annual basis or over multiple years. But then that, how we handle the vendors and the efficiency and working through these, um, it was pretty amazing to go through this. And really when you, you touch a system that touches every department within our government and changes the efficiency in which the way they do business, it really started to come clear how the estimates that they were putting out here at the 2.7 million up to the four and a half million a year were, were potential to be reality for us. So um, mm -hmm. I moved over to this and said, if this is one, we can bring it forward. You need to demonstrate the business case to the governing body. Mm -hmm. um, 
and we're in a unique situation here with how things are set out with our debt funding. I have a couple of questions up here. I, I can Jane. show I can show the various drivers um, uh, behind the business case. I have a, a, a slide on the back end here if you'd like to see it more detail. Okay, why don't we take some questions? I see uh, Commissioner Walters. Yes. Um, so this sounds like a great system to me and it sounds like it's well well needed. Uh, do have just a couple questions. Um, I am surprised that we found seven million dollars in reserves that we didn't know we had. And you know we spent so much time last year in the Finance Committee going through all of our reserve funds that I know Commissioner Burroughs would share this that it is surprising that we that we found this money. The, you mentioned earlier that these funds can only be used for certain purposes. Are we doing something uh, on the edge of improper by not using this money to lower the uh, the bond and interest uh, yeah. funds directly? So um, yeah, I I have a I have a graph later on which we can show um, which will demonstrate how the fund balance has grown over the past four or five years. And, and during our presentation um, last year, for example, uh, when we talked about the various uh, special reserve funds, we did, we did demonstrate that there, you know, at the time, all of the debt service funds totaled the fund balance of $10 million. Um, that was last year and it's only grown since then. So um, actually the transfer that we're coming from the fund balance is only this 33 million and this 1.9 million. So it's uh, this $5 million figure right here. This 1.5 million is actually coming from uh, transfers from other departments that are not city or county general fund, uh, mainly sewer. I, I, I did also wanna point out that um, there is the departments want a new system so badly that actually some of the departments were, were willing to make the payment out of their current budget. That's how desperate they were. Well, my question really is uh, <laughs> more from an equity standpoint. The people who paid the $1.5 million, for example, were they paying this on their sewer bill? Um, this money came from somewhere and now it's going to be used for something else. And I, I guess I just ha I'd like a little bit more information about that. The well, second, uh, oh. let me answer that question first, Commissioner. So, sure. when we look at a system like this, it supports all our operations. So the sewer fund has to support um, the finance back back system that also they get to operate under as well. So, when we come to something like this, we look at it and say, okay, the city, what's your allocation for payment to it? What are those that should come from the county side of the operation? And what are those that should come from enterprise funds with the largest one um, from an operating system being that of a sewer fund. So whether they're paying where the sewer funds paying the money on an annual basis to cover, uh, what do you call it? The back of the house type operations, HR and finance type operations that way or buying new equipment. That's uh, that is an expense that that fund must cover annually. Yeah. And the, the balances in the, the city and bond and interest fund have um, accumulated um, some excess reserves because of the refinancings that we have done uh, in the past four or five years, as well as the um, as well as underspending of bond proceeds. And so um, little by little, uh, those positive efforts have accumulated the balances. Um, so it, it, you know, they're, they're budgeted at a certain higher level, and then we reduce the costs and those, those reductions accumulated, you know, bits at a time. So, it, Yeah, it, and this it, is really the result of us not lowering the mill levy for the bond and interest fund as the reserves go up, right? Yes, as we looked at it, we were projecting forward to say, okay, if we continue on this trend, then we'll be in a good position. And that, as you'll see, as we go forward with the rest of the presentation, when we look at the future years, um, 
and spending and keeping things in that 15 million around that category, then it, that, that option clearly stays there, you know, and unless we want to spend more money in the debt area, but if you leave it there, then your option to start to reduce that mill rate has proven true that it's um, back to back years where we've been able to build money into the fund balance and shows that it's going to sustain its cost. Okay, well, this big picture, it just seems like if we are going to have property appreciating at five or 6% per year, we could potentially reduce our bond and interest mill levy. Um, but that's a separate discussion. Um, my, so my last question, I think, Doug, you touched on it. So there was an analysis done as to how much of this money should come from the city funds and how much should come from the county funds and that's how you came up with those numbers yeah it was uh, based on sorry to interrupt I, I i yeah it was based on the level of employee count for each uh fund that's what it was based on and that that's an indicator of the operational costs and need of the organization especially from the hr side yeah and did you say you had some additional analysis of that uh, oh you had additional analysis of the payback yeah here it is um, and where that five million four four million dollars will come from yes so we didn't provide this in your presentation because we we didn't want to do overkill on the erp system but uh, so this is the business analysis case analysis we um performed with some um ex some consultants and what we found is that through a basis of a variety of very conservative um, and likely uh, assumptions, we are expecting to save um, this amount of dollars between four and $6 million a year. And you understand we have a $400 million expenditure base across all of our funds. So, um, so you might be uh, surprised by the $6 million, but 6 million compared with the entire 400 and, you know, $400 million budget is, uh, um, you know, not that unreasonable. So um, we've looked at the conservative side and the likely side. And, and, and then on top of it, I took an average between the two. The, um, we expect to have savings of technology. In technology, we, we expect to have uh, improvements in our organizational performance through the use of a um, performance evaluation tool we expect to reduce costs that are what are called regrettable turnover by those employees who we hire and then they leave within a year. Um, and then we have to rehire and retrain and incur those costs. We expect to have savings in improved personnel requisition control, which right now we don't have. We, we, um, so it's difficult for us to pin down um, which positions are currently budgeted, but and, but left un, unbudgeted, but are vacant, and those that are vacant but budgeted, those kind of that co kind of coordination is difficult. Improvements in our hiring quality, in controllable um, overtime, um, improving our it, this was a huge one. Improving our absence management, um, improving payroll accuracy because we're having to calculate retroactive uh, payments uh, by hand. Um, and then a really big one is improving our spend control um, for, you know, any kind of potential rogue spending. And that, that 1.2 million, that's out of uh, $260 million in non-personnel spending across the entire organization. So um, I can, I'm happy to go through and show you the assumptions <clears throat> for each of these. I'm not going to do this today, but um, but just as an example, um, how, why, how does this improve our balance sheet? If, if we were to just improve our, our uh, absence management, we uh, say five years ago, um, we would be uh, our, our compensated absence leave liability on our balance sheet, sheet we estimated would be roughly five to $7 million lower than what it is now. And what does that mean? Well, that means that our net bottom line would be $7 million higher, and we would actually have a positive net position rather than a deficit net position right now. So there are a lot of reasons to 
really fully get a, a handle on on our um, spending and our administrative functions. So anyway, I could go on then. So. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Burroughs. Thank you. I, I do want to echo Commissioner Walter's uh, question. I, I uh, really appreciate him bringing that up because this is something the Finance Committee has worked on. Uh, and, and I'm sure we'll have plenty of time to discuss that and the impact of, of the reserves as we go along and their justification for utilizing them for this program. I will state, is there a maintenance uh, cost to the legacy program presently? Yeah. Um well, Alan could talk about that it comes out of his budget, but uh, roughly it's about uh, $280,000 a year and with a 7% per year inflator. So, okay. so I did want to mention, oh, go ahead. The, uh, the, um, one of the challenges is that you know, every two to three years, we end up doing a large um, upgrade to that yeah. system. And so you get these lumps where you're spending, you know, upwards of half a million dollars, sometimes significantly more than that on these upgrades. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so this switches that to a steady state, steady stream of uh, uh, known payments uh, for an annual subscription cost for our software. So it does make it actually easier to budget and, and ensures that we have the latest technology uh, and the updates on the system versus uh, falling behind as we've done on some systems where we skip those upgrades because we don't have the available resources. Uh, and so, you know, we become several years out of, out of date uh, and things just kind of start to get a little uh, uh, challenging, to put it that way. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't see that reflected in the numbers unless it's in one of the uh, projects. Yeah. It's in the technology savings. It's, yeah. You know, for uh, because program not only areas that. you have in there, I did not see that, but mm -hmm. I, yeah, but uh, know that there's, that, also, there's start... also 100000 a year that we spend on maintaining servers, um, which we would not be incurring um, if, because this is a SaaS system, so that we're looking at. Hey, I also wanted to mention that after one year or two years after implementation, we, uh, they, they come back and they reevaluate the business process analysis to see whether, in fact, the savings that, that they, you know, that we estimated is actually being realized. And so, for example, the city and county of Denver, they have surpassed the expectations. So the, 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 the savings that we're talking about is probably a conservative number um, because the improvements we expect are going to be significant. Mr. Burroughs, did we get your question answered? I know you kind of cut out there, so I yeah. to make sure unless there's something else. Well, thank you. The question was answered. I do know that there's some savings due to the uh, antiquated maintenance that is, is uh, demanded on the old system. I just want to again echo my support for a new system. I think in the long run, we will benefit in the next three years. I think we can look back as, as commissioners and as a, as a government body and be uh, grateful that we had an opportunity not only to uh, update our system, but to invest in modernization of our local government. And uh, I am in full support of this, and I will continue to do the research necessary to assist in whatever we can do to move this forward. And I do hope that the Finance Committee has a chance to go back and review some of the uh, funds that Kathleen talked about earlier. And I, again, I want to yeah. echo Commissioner Walters uh, in bringing that, that issue forward because it has been a point of discussion throughout the budget. Thank you. Okay, Kathleen, you want to move on to the next section? Yeah, so the, the next section is a business case for the fi what, fire station, the third fire station in the CMIP, which is fire station number four, Bethel, that also includes a traffic division facility. And um, we're, I'm letting uh, Alan talk about this because he's got fire under his assignment, so. Thank you, uh, Kathleen. So this is the uh, kind of the next uh, increment in the fire master plan uh, that has been presented to the commission in terms of the station replacement plan. 
Um, and so this is up around 80th and Leavenworth uh, is where station four is currently. And the, it is a combination as Kathleen mentioned between uh, potentially between a fire station and a new police station. So the police department recently moved their uh, traffic facility uh, over onto parallel after um, vacating a leased property on Leavenworth. And so looking for a more uh, permanent home for that facility and has, has been done uh, with other stations to do a co-located facility that would include both fire and, and police. Um, so again, this is continued investment in the uh, renewal and refurbishments and replacement of fire stations uh, that are that are needed uh, and have been identified through the comprehensive planning uh, on on the, the behalf of the uh, of the fire department. I don't know if the fire chief would like to uh, add anything up if he's on. No, I, I'm on, Alan. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. I'm on. I apologize for no camera. Got a new uh, ca uh, computer, and because of COVID and everyone zooming and. Skyping, there are no cameras available, so I apologize. Um, open for questions on this. This is going to be a station similar to the one at where Pumper 19 is on 80th Terrace and State, along with the uh, police facility at the other end. Uh, and that's pretty much it. You've all, you've, we've gone through this in the on threes. If there's any additional questions, I'd be happy to answer them. This is Commissioner Bynum. Just a quick question on this station plan. I know that we're going to open Piper and the next one in the plan, if I'm not mistaken, is Turner. And is this the third one after that? No, the, the next one after that is Muncie Station 20, currently mm -hmm. at 70, 78th in Kansas. Okay. And then this would be the one following that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So my, uh, I just wanted to mention, so the, so the current CMIP has two fire stations. The scenario one actually adds another million because uh, this one that's planned to be built in 2021 was a little short on the cost estimate. So the reason we're talking about Bethel specifically is because this $10 million is in scenario two for, okay, just so you know. And it's uh, in the last year of the CMIP. Any other questions on the fire station? I don't see any, Kathleen. Okay. So the next um, project that, that we wanted to pro provide a, a, a business case for is the streetlight projects. This is kind of a new project and yes, it is uh, rather expensive, but it would be transformational and for our neighborhoods and community. So um, uh, Jeff Fisher is going to talk about this. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, unfortunately, the condition of the streetlight system is similar to other infrastructure. Uh, much of it's very uh, old and outdated and uh, takes a lot to hold it together. There are over 20,000 lights in KCK, almost as many poles, and uh, of course a lot of infrastructure power in that system. Uh, we know much of the work, uh, much of the needs are east of 635, and so that should be a, a sort of a phase one of a project. Uh, the project priorities would be uh, improving system reliability and driver safety, uh, and then reducing O&M and um, investing in our neighborhoods and reducing energy costs through an LED uh, component to it. Uh, so it's a strong project. Uh, I think it scored well in, in the new uh, system. And uh, so I'll take any questions on that. I think one thing about seeing this project is that it kind of sets out just the order of magnitude of different directions to go. And as, they, as we put on the different scenarios, obviously this is one that says, okay, we're gonna go at a different level of investment. The street, you may look at it and say, this isn't our highest priority, 
um, there or something else. If we're going to spend this much money, I'd rather this go directly toward just right into the streets or something like that. So for me, it kind of set out two things. This is a very dynamic change of something that modernizes the entire city over a five-year process. It's one we've had a lot of conversation with the, the BPU about. Um, uh, you know, they're charged with um, <clears throat> paying the cost of street lighting, and they're also charged with the cost of they go out and do a lot of the maintenance on that. So the savings falls back on their end. It doesn't necessarily fall back on our end, um, but it would be a very dynamic change. There also could be other ways to go if you want to, you know, leave the millage in there um, toward that. <clears throat> Commissioner Walters. Excuse me, I forgot to unmute. Um, so I'm reading this and it says you're, this is not just replacing the current street lights. Uh, this is adding a whole new street lighting uh, program. Is that correct? Well, it, would, it would, it would depend different areas of uh, KCK require uh, have different needs. Uh, some of it would just be an LED changeover, uh, but much of it would be hard infrastructure replacement or repair. Uh, there might be some light spacing issues that we need to address oh, a variety of things. So that's, None of that engineering has been done at this point. No. Okay. Are there new standards uh, to street lighting that our current city's uh, street lights don't match? Yes. Um, I'll just mention the, the there is one neighborhood that I get a lot of calls about street lights, and uh, the problem is not the street lights. The problem is the trees. Uh, there are so many trees that have grown and matured. And um, I don't know if this program would address that at all, but uh, the streets are dark because of the trees, not because of the street lights. So I just bring that forward for you to, you know, factor into your thinking process a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Philbrook. Um, so my, um, my question is, runs just kind of along with Jim Walters and and that is so it sounds like we're going to be paying attention then from your answer Jeff is that we're going to be paying attention to uh, appropriate lighting engineering so we actually get better better lighting overall and which would which would help excuse me with uh, safety issues and because I know that most of us get calls constantly about lighting being out and then BPU is trying to catch up on taking care of those outages. And in the meantime, people are concerned and rightfully so that they don't have the lighting they feel they need to be safe where they are. So are we looking at this not just saving money, but also being able to do a better job of for our folks for lighting and for safety? Well, that is a primary objective is improving roadway lighting. Okay, well, we still have areas that, you know, people act, some people actually do walk uh, on sidewalks and that sort of thing. And we have other areas that we don't have sidewalks. So I'm hoping that as you guys look at this, that you really are paying very close attention to um, the placing um, or replacing of these uh, new lights. Absolutely. Commissioner Johnson. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I, I am in full support of this, um, the street light project. I, it seems to me that if we don't at some point make the investment, uh, the, the cost of this uh, will continue to go up and, uh, and up. I think uh, I remember a few years ago, and I might have been under different uh, different factors, but a few years ago we were talking about a number around $10 million, and now we're at $50 million. Um, so I think we need to go ahead, uh, per, uh, particularly on the eastern side of town, we have a lot of lights that uh, are knocked out, and, and, and it's just you know a lot of dark areas there. Um, this system, the question I have is this system, will it be 
better monitored by BPU in terms of knowing when we have outages and being able to recover? I'm just curious about that from an operational standpoint. That's a good question. The estimates, the $50 million estimate, uh, we believe would include certain controls on the system so that BPU knows when a light is out. Uh, they could even turn off a light or dim lights uh, for various purposes. So yes, yeah, be some controls on the system that we aren't there now. Yeah, that, that, that would be wonderful to be able to have better control of that. And this will pay for itself over what period of time in, in terms of estimates? I might have missed that somewhere. Uh, well, we haven't, we don't have that sort of, uh, the payback is a tougher thing to estimate. Uh, okay. But we yeah. can assume that there will be some benefit as is already identified in terms of economic benefit reduction and operating costs and things of that nature. Absolutely. Yeah. The O&M would be, would go down. We do have some idea of O&M, but I don't recall what that is, Commissioner. I'm sorry. Okay. The, um, no problem. Obviously. The savings on this becomes a difficult, um, if we were a, a paying customer, the Board of Public Utilities, and they were a private company, um, then you can go through and you can calculate what your bill would be each year and then reduction from the LED cost and then and calculate that and come back on it. So we've sat down with the BPU a few times on this. And, and while it would not be a direct savings to the unified government, we feel like there would be a savings to the Board of Public Utilities, uh, though since they generate the power they've had not really been able to come up with just a real clear number to say well this is what will save us per year we're hoping to work through this and i and i will say in, in putting this out here tonight um earlier in the year as jeff and his team were working on this you know it was like okay this is exciting this is a something that really could be good to put out we've talked about it for probably a couple of years from a staff perspective going through it. And it's like, okay, it's time to get this in front of the governing body and we have the real opportunities to maybe move forward and, um, and do something. Currently with um, uncertainty and where we are going forward, I would never, I would not come to you and say, let's build this into the 21 budget and let's start now and see what happens with uh, future revenue flows and the value of all our money. Um, so, but I still wanted to put it out there make sure the team had the opportunity to present it and then look at it as getting it on for future. Cause if we don't get things into that future five-year budget, then they never make their way forward. But wanted to get this input back from you all as if it's something that we do think this is a high priority and how we should try to work it in. Well, I, I certainly think it's a priority, but I think my concern is that the longer we wait on this, and certainly we're aware of the, the condition that we're in right now, but the cost of this is just going to continue to escalate with each passing year. So just something that we need to consider as well. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Bynum. Thank you. There's a adult housing development at 82nd and Walker that was purchased out of bankruptcy in order for it to be completed and therefore was allowed to be completed with no street lights. And I cannot remember the name of it, but I'm wondering if it's possible that if we proceed forward with this project, that we might be able to install a, at least a minimal amount of street lights into that development for the safety of the older adults that live there. And if it's possible then I'm just asking you to make note of that for when and if we do undertake this project. Thank you. I will look uh, into it in any case. Yeah, adding to it certainly is an option that comes to it. Probably would be small in the big comparison. That's the project that's is that the Patio Homes Senior Housing Project right across from the library, Commissioner? It is, and I just cannot remember the name. Yeah. I, I should know it too off the top of my head. Okay. That's okay. Pemberton Place, I believe. It is. Go. It's Pemberton Place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Alvey, I think you're next up. Yes, uh, to uh, uh, Commissioner Johnson, the, the savings. Uh, so the cost of this project uh, in the capital cost, the installation cost actually does is increasing year over year. The fixture costs have declined. So 
uh, they went from a high of about $170 per unit uh, to much lower than $100 now. So that part of the cost has declined, but of course the, the work that has to be done does continue to increase. And I think a lot of the cost, from what I understand, is going to be an installation of new poles, placement of new poles in different places. And the, the hard part about trying to figure out what the savings might be, uh, the Board of Public Utilities up to about five years ago uh, was able to self-supply its power through Nearman, Kundero plants, and other places. That changed with uh, the Southwest Power Pool when basically, which the you know, BPU is part of, uh, that uh, every uh, operator, every uh, generator in the Southwest Power Pool actually uh, bids their production into the system at a certain price point and they don't get called up to operate or to sell unless they get that price point. So any energy the BPU provides, they first purchase off the Southwest Power Pool and then they bid their own power back into it. That's one of the reasons why it's so hard to monetize this. Thanks for that, Mayor. Now it's completely clear as mud in terms of that analysis. Well, I won't do it again. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Townsend. Commissioner Townsend. Can you unmute? I believe you're coming on now, Commissioner. Can you? All right, thank you. A um, couple of things. I am in, in support of uh, the street light, uh, light project. We, we talked about it some years ago, but of course, with the number of lights, it, it's no small undertaking. A couple of questions. Um, Mr. Fisher mentioned this would be uh, a multi phase. Uh, project I, I understood from beginning to end how long would you estimate it would take to complete these approximately 20,000 light installations and I understand it's not just lights but in some places other infrastructure would be required uh, that would be the first question um, and this 50 million would cover all phases that's the second question okay. It's, it's, it's still so early. I'm not sure how many phases there will be or, or how long it will take uh, yet. We, sh we are working with Snyder Electric now and I uh, believe we, could, we would know that kind of information by the end of this year. And uh, the 50 million would cover all phases, we believe. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff, for that presentation. I don't see any more questions on that. So Kathleen, you want to move on to the next section? All right, so now uh, we get to the debt affordabil affordability questions, which Commissioner Walters brought up earlier too. So I um, wanted to tell you that this slide looks a little bit different than what you have in your packets. Uh, because, uh, well, we added a few things plus um, a few columns uh, just for information. But um, also, you know, we did a little tweaking, so I apologize. Um, but I'm happy to explain why it's a little different. But first off, um, we have the different scenarios here. So this first table on the top are um, uh, the scenarios with the current uh, 17 mills for the city on an interest fund. And then the table below is if we were to shift one mill out of the um, city bond and interest fund over to the city general fund or reduce it, you know. Um, in, in any case, the revenue for one mill would not be coming into the city bond and interest fund with this table below. Now, one other thing we did was um, we um, I added this first column here so that you had a uh, a feeling for what type of reserve level this fund should probably retain every a minimum reserve target and it's only 5% of tax revenues because it's not you know two months like an operating fund it's because um, this fund doesn't have any FTE or personnel being expensed in it 
Um, so it's not reliant for, on an operational basis. It simply is a re a receiving tax dollars and then cutting checks for debt service. That's all it does, this fund. And the other thing is in order to have a reserve, it would, uh, well, uh, the liquidity needs of this fund um, are such that on the like 20 days after the beginning of the fiscal year, we get one half of the property tax payment. So, and then the debt service for the, is only uh, interest uh, or yeah, interest in February. So the, the, so there's really not a lot of need for a lot of cash to be sitting in this fund at year end because there's a lot of cash that comes in very soon at the fiscal year and very little goes out um, during the first half of the year. So, so that's why we have a reserve fund of just 5%, all right? Um, the, uh, so here we have a modest scenario and a worst case scenario. And I'm going to go through those assumptions with you here in a moment. Um, but uh, for the most part, the modest scenario is what we expect will happen um, given a, you know, a moderate impact of the COVID um, pandemic on our revenue structure in this fund. And then the worst scenario is if there's a prolonged impact into the future. Now these fund balances are of course, the difference between you know, what's sitting in the checking account and what we collect in revenues minus what we expense for the next five years. So this is a fund balance we project in five years from now. Um, this isn't for very, you know, next year, it's five years from now. <clears throat> um, so uh, for each one of these scenarios, I have a slide that um, has graphically shows how, um, you know, over the course of the years, how the performance of this fund in this given scenario looks. So I'm happy to, you know, show that to you as well. Uh, the, the, over here, we've provided a governmental debt per capita, which is um, a calculation that our new model provides us. Um, so along with many other debt ratios that um, we've had difficulty to provide in the past. So, and then the last one is another ratio called the governmental debt as a percentage of assessed value. Um, and then I've just provided a little comparable, you know, comparable entities and how much their, their ratios are. Okay. So currently the adopted, uh, so just real quick to go over the, the assumptions, I'm going to, I'm going to race forward to this one slide that we didn't want to bore you with, which is uh, the revenue assumptions on a modest case uh, revenue um, scenario. So um, for the most part, here's the key one, because see this fund only pretty much collects uh, property tax revenue. And we don't think that property tax revenue is going to be dramatically impacted by the COVID. Um, but we have reduced um, the 20, well, the 2020 budget, we've increased our delinquency rate in the amended um, revenue estimate from oh, roughly, I had think I had it at 5.7, which is consistent with what it's been in the past. I've upped it to 9% in delinquency. So that was the only change I've made in the 2020 budget is, you know, to accommodate the expectation that we may have some residents that are gonna have trouble making their property tax payments this year. Um, and so, and that assumption carries into 2021 and 2022 with it recovering in the, in 2023. Uh, the other thing that we've adjusted is that, uh, um, well, we've got, you know, we've already got the appraisal from the, um, the county appraisal. So we know that for the most part, our property taxes will likely go up between the seven and 8% level. So those have already been um, set by the, our county appraiser. But in the next subsequent year, perhaps there may be a likelihood that uh, the property values will be growing at a low, lower rate than what they have in the past. So I've got it at 3.8 at 8% with it recovering in the subsequent years off that lower base. So this is the modest case scenario. Um, what we're thinking is like, likely. The next one is the worst case scenario. And here, um, I, I still, this is the, well, I, I forgot to put the, the years up here, but this column here is 2020. 
And then this column is 2021. So 8%, rather than the, rather than the uh, 7% I have in 2021, I've upped the uh, delinquency rate, but basically one percentage point across there. And uh, the other thing that I've done is down here below the assessed value, um, I've got it uh, in 2021, uh, dropping the flat to zero and then only increasing by 2% 2 in the subsequent year. So, um, so this is a dramatic reduction in the property values, all right? So this column right here, this column with the 0% is 2022 or 2021. No, 2022, sorry, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, and then this is, so the thing is, uh, uh, we're not talking about 2021 because the county appraiser already came in with her uh, appraisal. So we're talking about 2022. There's a delay um, in the uh, economic impact on property taxes of at least one to two years. So that's why, so that's the worst case. Um, so going back to the slide we were talking about before, uh, a little bit more here. All right, so um, with the adopted budget, we expect the ending fund balance for the city bond and interest fund to be $12.1 million at the end of 2025. Under the worst case scenario, it would be 6.6 .6 million. Um, with scenario one, which is, and all, all scenarios one, two, and three include um, the uh, transfer out of um, reserves for the ERP system, okay? Um, so uh, the scenario one, we would end the year with 9.2 million at the end of 2025. And under the worst scenario, it would be 3.8 million. Now you understand this is five years out. So if the revenues were in fact dramatically reduced to the level um, uh, as expressed in the worst case scenario, um, we can make corrections in terms of what kind of uh, capital investment we're gonna subsequently do in order to diminish any kind of impact. But understand that 3.8 seems like a lot lower than what we're at, but but our reserve minimum reserve is 1.4. Really don't need that much. Um, is there a question? I don't see anything, Kathleen. I think somebody just had some feedback on them. Okay, so <clears throat> scenario two includes the additional investment in street preservation. Is that me? Am I feedbacking? Hello? Um, can't tell. Hard to tell. Um, all right, so scenario two, uh, we would end with a uh, slightly lower at 8.6 or with the worst case 3.2. Um, the interesting thing is scenario three with that $50 million investment in streetlights we would end um, under the modest case with, we would still end 2025 with under the modest case with 6.5 million and, and with the worst case, $1 million, which is below the minimum target. Now, down below here, if we were to do all these three scenarios under the worst case, and we shifted a mill out in 2022, which by the way, we looked at doing that for 2021, but we felt, I just didn't think it was a prudent thing to really be doing um, while we're a little unsure about what's happening with COVID. So we're, we're presenting you this scenario, uh, possibly shifting a mail out um, in 2022, um, which is next budget year. Um, under, the, uh, under the modest case, it's affordable to do that mill shift as Commissioner Walters has talked about. Um, if, this, if the revenues come in much lower, if uh, assessed value is flat in 2022 and then only increases by 2% in the subsequent year, then it's probably not advisable given the fact that we're projecting a uh, negative fund balance. So, so now I have a slide, a graphic slide for each of these scenarios, well, the top, these top four up here, which I'm happy to show you. Um, should I show one or two of them? Um, Doug? Or I have a question from Commissioner Walters first. 
<clears throat> yes, just a quick question. Why do you keep talking about shifting? Why are we just not talking about reducing the mill levy for the bond and interest fund? I, I think she's probably using that as a just a term. I mean, that would be that would be your option. I mean, you reduce the mill rate. Uh, shifting would only be as if we moved it, I guess. Moved well, it over I, I, thought you, budget. I thought you were talking about reducing the bond and interest mill, but increasing the general city general mill levy or something. So that's my question. Yeah, that would be an option, but. No, I don't think that's really the intent. I think I think she was using the term shift as in okay. shifts it out of it as far as Thank you. expense. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show some of these graphs for you so you can see what's possible. And um, I'm happy to meet with each of you privately to talk about this in more detail. Okay. Uh, this is the Kansas City, Kansas Bond and Interest Fund with the CMIP as adopted under the modest case. And um, so as you can see here on the left, this table here shows the, the margin between revenues and expenditures. The revenue is the green line and expenditures is the red line. And so this is the difference between the two in each of these years through 2030. Um, Commissioner um, McKiernan specifically likes to see this <laughs> graph because then it gives you a realistic picture of the level of spending and, and revenue, coming, uh, co revenue coming in and spending going out, right? Um, just so you know, we started this graph, all these graphs start at 2016. And you can see here, uh, here on the left is the fund balance of this fund. Uh, the fund balance was at $10.7 million in 2016. And it had been consistently around there, it had been growing a little bit by little prior to that period. Um, as I mentioned, the, these reserves are because of refundings or the assessed value was higher than we expected or that, um, or just uh, bond proceeds that were unspent that got redeposited into this fund. So over time it grew. Now it, it grew up to $15 million during this time because of uh, one major reason. The, uh, the Midtown TIF um, district, right? Um, we were collecting revenue and, but we were, uh, well, no, um, the Midtown TIF has its own fund outside of this one. And we were paying the debt service on that Midtown TIF out of that other debt service fund, but it was not collecting any revenue. So when we refinanced it, we had to unwind that debt and to pay off the Midtown TIF, we had to pull fund balance out of here in order to make that debt service payment. So that's why it dropped down to the $6 million level at the end of fiscal 19. So that's where we are now at $6 million. And that you can see that, that refinancing happening here. Which, by the way, when we refinanced that Midtown TIF, we saved $5 million over the next uh, 10 years. So it was a good deal to get it refinanced. Um, over the course of with the current adopted CMIP, um, even with the, so, so yeah, with the current CMIP over the next 20 years, we'll, or to, no, 10 years, we'll um, grow a fund balance of $45 million. Given our current uh, CMIP plus 15 million a year beginning in 2026. Okay. Um, if we were to go with, uh, and by the way, I just wanted to point out there's another slide here. Um, this assumes, this scenario assumes that we continue to make the debt service on the two stormwater projects that we had to issue bonds for um, that roughly were around, well, in total $20 million. Um, although that's not the storm portion, there's some sewer portion that is part of that 20 million. But, um, but now this fund is having to pay $900,000 a year um, in debt service for those two projects because we did not um, have, we, do, we don't have a stormwater um, rate that's sufficient to make the debt service on those projects. So if we were not to um, be making those payments out of this property tax 
funded city bond and interest fund, um, then we would end up with $55 million a year at the end of 2030 instead of the 45 million. So just, just thought we'd uh, let you know that. <laughs> Any questions? So uh, uh, one question from Commissioner Markley, Kathleen. All right. Okay, it's not, actually, it's not really a question. It's more of sort of a statement. I feel like sometimes as we get into more detail, it, um, it can become difficult for people to filter out sort of the main point of the discussion. So I'm gonna make more of a statement and then I want you to tell me that if I'm correct or not. So really the whole point of today's presentation is that we are in a position where it would be appropriate for us to spend down some of the balance in this bond and interest fund. And we can't just take that money out of the bond and interest fund and put it into the general fund, which would be lovely, but we are not allowed to do that. So we're discussing what are the options that would allow us to get done some of the projects that we want to get done and to spend down this balance, which is we're in a good position to do because we have more money saved than we need. And then subsequently, there's sort of a separate discussion around whether going forward, we keep putting the same amount of money into that fund because we know it built up more than it should have. Are both of those sort of accurate statements? Yes, that's yes. a good, good summary of the situation we're in. And I, I think Kathleen, you've gone into enough detail with that. I don't mm -hmm. think we need to stay on that. I think we can go back over to our policy slide that I think is where we kind of go to next after this. Yes, okay, good. The commissioner has done a good job of mm -hmm. setting that up. So yeah. Um, as we look at this, you know, that as you said, you know, we have the stormwater projects over there that's listed on here, but that's a policy discussion of if we adopt a stormwater program, we can still move them over. They're in debt right now, but we'll be moving those into a uh, full financing next year and they will be under this fund. So they eat up part of that, that room. Um, it's looking at street lights as a future scenario to build into the, into the budget. Um, the investment in our, ERP system that we threw out there that is uh, one where we're coming in saying, you know what, with the money that's in the debt finance, this is an opportunity for us to do this. And our analysis of it shows we can kind of going back to the PBB piece of it, we can save a few million dollars a year once we have this implemented. So that's a ongoing efficiency operating forever. And if you remember those PBB charts, we had one on that said, back on our annual operations. There's areas we need to find it in. Well, this is one of them we identified and said we can come in and find it this way. Um, keeping money out, going after the, the street preservation, high on the survey, always been something the commission talks about doing. Um, we have the uh, fire stations that are programmed in for 21, 23, then we move on to 25 with one that goes with the joint station with the traffic facility. So it's, it's, it's how we leave those out there. If we stay in scenario two, um, augmenting other capital funding needs. So really that's where it comes down to it or it's, um, so we have some scenarios we've shown where we can do it. We can, I, I, like I said, I'm reluctant to recommend scenario three with the street lights. I would not be ready to move on that next year. I think that's one where we should keep that in our back pocket as something to be future and see how our property tax revenues perform. And if that's a scenario you get or something you guys want to do, um, then we give that a more serious look next year. The, the mill rate uh, does present itself the option to start to reduce it and unless we see things fall off and keep falling off much worse than we really think it'll happen. Um, I think we can pay for those projects and drop that as a mill rate. Um, as she said, I guess commissioner Walters, maybe the option would be, and we'd have to run that scenario to, to, sh to actually do a shift this year. I've thought about that somewhat to move it from debt over to operating for one year, let that fall into operating fund balance. And then, then we could plop it out in 22, but I wouldn't want to take it off until we know we're, how we get through everything this year. So it's kind of the overall on the survey or overall on the policy where we're at. I think uh, Commissioner Markley did a good job of summarizing some of the most uh, 
relevant points to it. So mm -hmm. open to your thoughts and comments on this as we move forward. It's just or, super uh, exciting. Thank you. Mayor? Yes, you know, in general, I would just, you know, make the observation that the infrastructure across our city in so many ways is in serious need of repair. The longer we delay doing these projects, the more expensive they become. And I, I'm convinced that when we don't invest in our neighborhoods, when we don't invest in our, in our infrastructure, it is a very short route to losing pride, uh, losing a desire to maintain one's own properties, and uh, we will just continually see decline. And so uh, as hard as it is to take on more debt, I would argue that if we don't take on more debt at this point or do what we need, you know, in moving some of these funds around, uh, we're just simply going to continue to see deterioration across all of our infrastructure and to the point where uh, some, some things will just uh, become uh, unaffordable completely. Uh, Commissioner uh, Johnson's point that the, the cost, for instance, of the uh, streetlight project that will increase over time, most likely. Certainly, we know what's going to happen with our stormwater. We've seen enough of that. Uh, we also know what our street conditions are like. So I think it's, it's really our responsibility to step up and really take care of the infrastructure, just as we ask our residents to take care of their own infrastructure. Commissioner Johnson. I would have to agree with the mayor um, on this. And I know that this is very, it's gonna be very challenging um, so I know we have to be um, as, as open-eyed as possible to make sure that we're, you know, uh, taking care of our initial responsibilities. But uh, to, to kind of pile on what he is saying, the, particularly the older parts of town um, have been neglected for so many years. Uh, to, to the thought of continuing that type of neglect, uh, I think would really have a big problem on the overall morale that we're trying to build up through our neighborhoods. And so while I understand that the circumstances uh, that we're dealing with right now as they stand are, are, are quite challenging, um, I, I just would implore uh, us to try to figure out how we can, I guess, cobble together funds that will help us to continue to invest in infrastructure overall um, as, as we're looking into the future, uh, the, the immediate future. Um, uh, so that's what I want to make sure that I, I, I implore that we try to find out areas where we can cobble money together to continue to, or to, you know, continue to make sure we're investing, uh, in our infrastructure overall, particularly in the older parts of town. Thank you. Um, and that is a strong, strong move for the future of the community. When we look at things like that, um, Second part of this, or the next part of this project, or the presentation tonight goes into the um, PVC, which is also a debt project. So it's not completely live in, leaving the subject. It just changes the uh, funding source that we're looking at. So I know we are two hours and 15 minutes into this. So I, I think this part of it gets a little less uh, complex as we go through it, but we do still have some scenarios. So. Kathleen, I'll turn it over to you to, to our, I believe Debbie has this part. So we'll turn it over to Debbie Johncher and let her um, take us through these sections. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, Debbie Johncher, Deputy Chief Financial Officer. Um, I apologize, I also do not have a camera today. Um, so um, the first slide that I'm gonna go through, uh, Kathleen's covered some of this previously in her, um, in the presentation earlier, but, uh, we're going to talk about the county debt funded projects, which also includes the building uh, facility projects, which are uh, funded with the Public Building Commission. So we've got the scenarios for the county fund here. Um, the first one is the adopted CMIP. And as we stated earlier, there is uh, no additional debt uh, in the outer years approved currently for 20 years 21 through 25. 
scenario one would add about 8 million in projects. And I'll, in the next slide, we'll have a list of those projects, but it includes improvements uh, for the courthouse, uh, also for the West Annex, the, the Wyco Park waterline repair, and the quiet zone phase two in 2024. Scenario two uh, does not include any additional uh, facility or infrastructure projects, but it does um, add the additional 1.9% transfer that Kathleen talked about for the ERP system um, to be covered. So that would include that scenario would include the transfer of the 1.9 million. Scenario three adds in additional deferred facilities for the West Annex building totaling about 1.7 million uh, for the five year total. And this slide here shows um, all of these projects. Uh, as we said, we've got about 8 million in scenario one. Uh, and then in scenario three, the additional West Annex improvement projects totaling about 1.7 million. Um, I was gonna ask John Kelly if he wanted to talk up specifically about any of the projects that are on the list. Uh, yeah, Debbie, I just I, I do want to talk to some of the ones that focus on the courthouse and the the, uh, the West Annex and the jail. Uh, you know, these are some things as we we've we been working with Amoresco that we want to make sure that we bring to uh, you, you and the elected body to uh, make sure if we feel that this is uh, something that we want to invest these dollars uh, into these uh, uh, facilities. Uh, we're going to be talking in a couple slides here about some of the things where we have uh, some like services where maybe we can uh, combine those type of things and talk about whether we're wanting to essentially invest. Uh, you know, we know the jail's not going anywhere. So those, those dollars there are much needed. That is a system that we want to put in place uh, especially with the uh, recent COVID-19, uh, those dollars are to talk about uh, putting in a system into all the air handlers. Uh, a lot of the people that come in and out of our uh, jail uh, have the tendency, tendency to have some uh, health issues coming in or essentially maybe getting them from being in confined spaces with lot, without a lot of air movement. So these are some pieces of equipment that we're looking to put in to ensure the the health of our inmates and then as well as our uh, staff that work there. And uh, with the courthouse, we, we know that's a historical facility, that's a beautiful building. And we wanna make sure that we continue to put dollars into the courthouse that we can preserve that uh, historical value to that building. So it's just a few of the things, but like I says, further in the slide, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the annex and uh, uh, the, the, the current court service building, you know, we're currently have a, a major investment going on with the new juvenile detention that will take some court functions over to that new facility. So there are some options that we're looking at and working with uh, Amoresco as well as my team and uh, uh, Mr. Fisher and Doug on how we how, we're, how we go about it for the future and how we may want to invest some of these capital dollars and uh, making better decisions. Thanks, John. Um, okay, so these are uh, similar. This is similar to the graph that Kathleen showed for the city bond and interest. Um, and this is for the county. Uh, as with the city, this fund is uh, supported with uh, property tax revenues. So we've got the same information here. The minimum target, minimum target reserve for this fund, we uh, project to be about 300,000. The same with the city debt service fund. There is no uh, personnel paid from here. It is all, all of the funds are used for the payment of uh, principal and interest on debt. Um, and as she stated with, we've got the modest and worst case scenarios. Uh, as she stated with the modest case, um, the delinquency rate for 2020 was increased uh, to 9% um, and 7%, I think for 2021. So with that, um, with the adopted CMIP, we would uh, estimate the, under the modest case scenario, the uh, fund balance to be 4.2 million uh, going all the way down. Uh, if we went through scenario three, that would drop the fund balance to about 782,000, which is still above our 5% target reserve of 300,000. 
the worst case scenario, which uh, dropped the delinquency to 9% and then kept it at 8% for 2021 and the assessed value growth at for 0% in 2022 for the adopted CMIP with not having any future projects, our fund balance would be 3.4 million. Um, with scenario one, it would be down to 240,000. However, with scenario two and three, which scenario two was the transfer for the ERP and scenario three was additional West Annex projects, that would draw the fund balance negative uh, if we were in the worst case scenario. So that would drop, um, if, we, if we were at that situation, it would, uh, doing scenario three would drop the fund balance negative. Um, and then she's got the same percentages, the, the debt per capita and the assessed uh, debt as a percent of assessed value. I just want to make a clarifying point. Um, actually, I, I, I um, failed to mention to Debbie that actually under scenario one, that this transfer would occur in scenario one as well. I just didn't put it into this table. I overlooked doing that. So actually this scenario one uh, fund, fund balance at 2025 includes the transfer of 1.9 million in 2021 and two. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So then the uh, policy question for the county debt service uh, relates to the facility on uh, for deferred capital needs. Should we continue to, in should we invest in the two aging facilities, uh, the West Annex facility, which is at 8200 state, um, deferred maintenance projects uh, right now total about 2.3 million. And then the court services facility um, at on 7th Street across from across the street from the courthouse, deferred maintenance projects uh, for that facility are about 4.5 million. So I guess alternatives to consider uh, would be to acquire more modern facilities to centralize services or invest in underutilized space currently owned by the unified government. And I think as we throw these out here, these are really ones that when I started seeing the the number of items that started adding up in and around the West Annex facility, um, that's where I challenged back to the team to go, okay, what about an alternative of doing something that is a, just as it's put up here, a more modern facility. When you think about what we do out at the Annex, um, if we were able to build a centralized facility for our motor vehicle operations, take those out of the courthouse, you know, I mean, it, things like that could be more centrally located in the community um, and work from that perspective, rather than <clears throat> dumping in a couple million dollars into a, into a building that was not built for our purpose. You know, it's one we've modified and I think it's working well for us, but there could be other, other long-term solutions. So, that's where we pushed out the um, any modifications to the West Annex facility until we can really go through and evaluate that, and um, and I think come back to you with a, a stronger recommendation of what a comparable would be if we were to do some type of joint facility. Commissioner Bynum. Thank you. I have some questions about court services, but mostly about the West Annex. And so I, I could really get behind modernizing and centralizing those services that take place at the Annex building. Um, I might also just throw out that if we keep services in the county courthouse, and keep an annex operation, we might consider moving it a little further west. Folks in Bonner and Edwardsville are, you know, coming into 82nd and State to do that business. So that would just be one thought. Um, in terms of either acquiring a new facility or using space that we currently own somewhere else. Do you all have those places in mind or is this more of a conversation for later? I think that 
that's more of a conversation for later, Commissioner. We're, I'm throwing it out there as when John went through and did his MRSCO study with them, they come back and they identified quite a few needs on that building. And then we've noted we have parking needs out there. We have a lot of different projects that are tied to it. And I think that's where, for me, I come back and go, and maybe that's where I'm throwing it out to you, commissioners. If I were to come back and say, okay, we bought this building many years ago, we moved into it, it's, it's worked fine. But I think the best long-term plan for us is to take it out of our inventory and, and do something that is suited for what, what our purpose is in serving the public and what we're trying to do out of that. And if, and if you look to that and, and if your vision aligns with that to say, yeah, I think that would make sense or no. Um, I mean, from one perspective to go out and build new government buildings, which could be a scenario if that's just something we don't want to do outside of building the fire stations and the, the police that we've talked about. Um, but for other operations, if that's something where we look at that and say, that's not a scenario we really need to be following down, then we can, then we'll look at the modifications to this building or if there's some other, but mm -hmm. that's really what I wanted to get a feel from you all on. Okay. I, I would, I would just say, I would support very much looking at alternatives to the annex. Um, and then just a second question on that. If we were to develop a, a different annex. Um, then that would be a building we could sell, correct? Yes. Yeah, we would move all our operations out of that and hopefully be able to turn that over to someone else. It's, it, it has a purpose. I mean, it's a good, not okay. a bad building. Thank you. Mayor. Yeah, I'm just, I guess I was just a little bit confused, but the, the conversation just helped. I, really, the, the policy question is not whether we want to put money into West Annex or court services, that's going to be an operational question that you would then come back to us to say, well, this would be the cost of continually supporting those sites other rather than actually investing in something new. So the alternatives, options to consider are really the policy questions. The policy question is not whether we put money into the West Annex or the court services facility, but whether as a, in a general rule, we want to build new facilities that are specifically purposed for our operations. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you for the feedback and um, any future feedback you give us would be appreciated as we look at this. Okay, so the, the next section that we're going to go to is the um, the sewer and stormwater debt, which I think is going to be covered with by Sam Herr from Public Works. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, this is Sam Herr, Public Works Physical Officer. Uh, I'm covering the sewer debt funded projects this evening. So from uh, 2021 to 2024, we have planned out uh, 49.6.5 million um, in projects. With the addition of uh, 2025 and new projects, uh, we add in $71.5 million uh, of projects. Um, uh, over the next couple of slides, I'll look into the heart of uh, what we do as a service and uh, highlight a few key projects. So this is the heart of what we do. Uh, we serve our community while trying to our best to protect our environment. Um, as the community expands, our services expand um, and our focus is still um, on protecting our natural resources. Secondly, due to the dual uh, nature system that we have, uh, we not only work with wastewater, but we work with stormwater. We work to uh, minimize flooding um, emphasize the protection of life and property. And thirdly, um, with our treatment plants, we strive to maximize our capacity uh, for wastewater collection and wastewater treatment in accordance with uh, state and federal regulations. Uh, these are the, our three primary focuses um, of our operations with wastewater. In this slide, uh, we have three highlighted projects um, 
The first is the Walcott Treatment Plant Project. This project is currently underway. Um, it is estimated at $50.2 million. With this project being underway, um, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and we're excited uh, to expand our service in the northwest part of our community. It'll also uh, take down flows and um, the service, uh, uh, reduce uh, service levels a little bit of the current uh, plant 20 in that area. The second project that we want to highlight is the Call Point Biosolids project. This project is a project that may stretch um, into the entire region and through uh, multiple communities. This project is very exciting because it opens doors for future uh, potential revenue opportunities through uh, reapplication of materials from this uh, process. This project is one that uh, we'll be covering more on the authorities at the end of the month. The last project that we have that we wanna highlight is our asset management systems uh, program. So this is more than just a project, but it is a program um, to help us with our existing infrastructure, uh, sewer infrastructure. Um, it is a plan to help us rehab and rebuild um, infrastructure in older areas um, and help us maintain and uh, stay in line with the consent decree in the uh, IOCP. This is really a new way of thinking and considering um, our sewer system. So we're very excited to uh, review these two projects and this program with you. Um, we really want to remind you of the importance and the essential uh, services of wastewater. And uh, we would like to uh, remind you of the importance of additional um, investment in, store, uh, in sewer infrastructure. Thank you, Sam. That's kind of a highlight of some of the things we're doing through that enterprise fund. As you know, those are fun projects that come into play a lot with what we are moving forward with in accordance with our pending consent decree um, and lining those out for the best way to go through and spend those dollars to make the uh, improvements in our community. All right. Jeff, I don't see any additional questions. I think you have the next section. Okay, thank you. Uh, the content of these next two slides uh, should look familiar. Uh, uh, we've got, this is the stormwater utility. Uh, the first slide here just represents um, this. It's a piece of the seven year plan that were, was proposed and discussed back in January and February. So this is the five years of that seven year plan representing the amount of uh, borrowing the stormwater utility fund would uh, would uh, take on. And those are just the three projects of the multiple that I'll outline here in a minute. Uh, so in the first five years, 21 through 25, these would be the three projects and then there would be additional projects after that. Next slide, please. Um, you've seen, uh, this slide and next slide, this is the outline of the capital projects for the seven years, $18.7 million. Um, just haven't seen it in this format, uh, but it is the same information we've discussed previously. Next slide, please. Again, this is the balance of those capital projects in stormwater totaling 18.7. Next slide, please. And then this is the remainder of that uh, work plan outline for that seven years. Uh, and you might notice at the bottom table, again, that's the Kansas levies betterment and uh, wing wall projects that are ongoing and currently funded through geo bonds and the general fund. Didn't wanna spend a whole lot of time on that since we have discussed this uh, quite a bit here recently, but I'll field questions if you have some. Jeff, probably the takeaway that really goes back on this as you've thrown up here, you got $64.3 million worth of projects, but that's based on us having a, a additional funding source that goes towards stormwater. So without that, you're gonna spend about a million and a half a year. Thank so you. yeah, we're gonna spend 5 million. We have 64.3 million we need to spend in the next five years, but we are on pace to spend, yeah, the 7 million, I guess, right? It's been a million and a half a year. 
Right, and then the two projects we have ongoing, that would be. No, it isn't a million and a half a year. It's a million and a half over five years. Over, okay, so it's yeah. 60, hmm. 60 million dollars worth of projects, but at our current pace, we'll spend 1.5 million. That's right. And I think you all know that, but I think we just have to highlight it. I don't know that we spent enough time on it on previous budget years to point out just the vast number of stormwater projects that are out there. They just fall into the unfunded category and then they disappear. So there is a huge need in this area um, and we're not shifting it over into the other part of the budget. Other than when they come up and they're urgent like the two that are there now that are be taking 900,000 out of our uh, general fund operations. I don't see any questions on that. So, Jeff, I think you continue on, don't you? Well, I think. Um, so, Reggie is next. He's going to go over these um, other debt funded and grant projects. Thank you. Can you hear me now? We can um, hear you, Reg. Well, I'm clear, buddy. Cool. Hope I didn't make everybody dizzy when I was on last time moving around. <laughs> All right. Current slide, we have projects that fall outside city debt and public building commission on the county side. So these are either special revenue projects or they're grant projects. So in the first section, we have a Interstate 70 internal diagonal interchange restructuring, which is a di diverging diamond interchange. Uh, it's funded by the state. And then also we have the Northeast Patrol Station which currently doesn't have any funding, but uh, when we do plan to build it, it'd be a standalone patrol division. And then the next one is the enterprise, the ERP system that we touched on earlier, uh, which would be fund, paid from fund balance. Then the second set of projects are uh, those that are financed by grants or portions of grants. So the first one is the, the Seventh Street and Central Avenue reconstruction which is to widen the roads and improve the curves and amongst other things. And then the next one is Safe Routes to School for Northwest Middle and Carruthers Elementary. And then the next one is for a new animal service facility and that's to build a better animal service uh, facility that we're definitely in need of. On the yes. next slide, uh, oh, I just wanted to point out that this is the, the grant portion of the animal services facility. The city bond and interest fund has the debt portion. So, all right, next slide, please. So, with our capital, capital process that we started back in October 2019. We have moved through this process and we have covered the green boxes here in most of the processes. So we have uh, conducted analysis on our capital investments. Um, we've used prioritization with our facility condition index, capital criteria, and then other prioritization tools that we have. And then we've also looked at the impact of, of the financials and then we've also accessed the feasibility by using our core groups um, to make sure that there won't be any difficulty implementing projects. And then we have developed uh, the, the, the different scenarios that we were brought to you today. And then the scenarios that were discussed, um, we just we had a point in time where within the organization, we discussed them with, discussed them with the executive team and also senior managers. And then the last green box is what we're doing today, where we have brought it to the governing body to give you time to um, deliberate and have discussion with us about this. So we have uh, three more in blue, three more processes that we must go through, and that's where uh, more deliberation will come. And then after the deliberation has come and we finalize, we'll develop a CMIP implementation action plan, and then will implement it. So now I'll turn it back over to Doug. 
Thank you, Reggie. I think you laid it out well with those last comments. I mean, I think as as we've gone through this tonight, we've laid out the the different scenarios. One in the city general fund um, that was within the uh, what's in the county side for those equations. If you look at scenarios one, two, and three um, in each of those areas, um, also doing the contrast about what we may be able to do with or we should be able to do with our mill rate in future years. I think as you look at that county side of the equation too, that option starts to come into the into that too, as we look out into probably 23. So you have some options as how much we're allocating money toward debt or not allocating as much money toward debt um, of what you might want to do with the mill rate. And I think that is where it falls in line with the policy discussion. Um, we tried to provide a balance of doing some projects um, and, and increasing a little bit where we're at. And that's why we come in with multiple scenarios, or you can get a little more aggressive after it and say, that's what we want to do in future years. So I really appreciate my staff. They spent a lot of time working through this scenario tonight. There's a lot of information in there. Um, believe it or not, this presentation was probably twice this long. Um, and then trying to go through and, and break it back down. So it made a lot of sense in working through it to, to explain it to you all and get it. Um, you see the number of people that are listed on here, plus there are many more that um, invested time in putting this together. So if you have questions going through this, please don't hesitate to come back and ask, and we will be coming back with more, um, more follow-up as Reggie said. Um, I see a question out there from Commissioner Kane. Okay, did I, did I get back on? Okay. You were on. There you go. Uh, I realize I haven't said a lot tonight. Uh, I think I'm more nervous about the virus and it's unknown. And to, I guess I'm worried about the short future and the long future and has some reservations about doing a whole lot of stuff, not knowing what the future holds for us. And uh, so I don't want to get the cart before the uh, horse, but I do think we need to take a serious look at and, and watch what the governor's doing, make some adjustments there and walk slowly, not run, because we're not ready to do either. Thank you. I think you're you're right on it is uncertain times. So when we don't really know for certain what's going to happen, you know, we can make projections and you feel like property tax is one, which is where debt comes from or where we fund our debt from. And you feel like it's something that can stay stable, but it could be, could be up and down a little bit here until we know that it's, it's, it's number one where you want to go out and leverage a lot of it. Any other thoughts tonight? I think we are planning to come back next next week. Um, we may have some issues with that trying to work through, but um, as you saw in the month of May, we have some changes that are on our calendar because of the graduations that we had scheduled with both the sheriff's graduation and the um, police graduation are no longer going to take place as far as formal graduation ceremonies. We think even if the climate changes where you come, we're still not going to be calling a bunch of people together and and families into our commission chambers um, and such like that. So <clears throat> in talking to the sheriff and the chief, they're making other arrangements with those with those groups so that what they can do to engage their families, they will, but they'll proceed with their graduations. But the other side of that is it does free up some time with our, uh, our special session timeframes to, to work with those time slots that we previously didn't have. So um, we'll be looking at those as we um, advance through our budget process with capital and operating in the month of May. Um, Commissioner McKernan. Thank you, Doug. You certainly, everyone, I appreciate all the work that everybody's done. This is a ton of information that's gonna require a lot of digestion. And I think you can count on all of us to come back with additional questions and maybe requests for clarifying information. I would ask if we have information that goes out next week that it be posted on Civic Clerk uh, 
typically we don't have agenda packets associated with special sessions. We have agenda packets associated with regular commission meetings. And so when I went to civic clerk this week, all I saw was the notice of meeting. It didn't occur to me to keep scrolling down that there was a, a PowerPoint attached to that. And so I would just ask that we separate the notice of meeting from any supporting materials so that we can see and download and review both ahead of time. Thank you. Okay, we will try to work on that so you don't miss anything. Anyone else? Mayor? I think we're done. No, if thank we don't you. have any other questions. I, no, I have no more questions. Um, no other hands raised. That concludes our special session. Thank you all for attending for the presentations as well. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. It was very well done.